Minsu, thank you for coming and speaking with me here today. Now, the reason I reached out to you is because you wrote this fascinating piece uh, recently titled The Problem with Han. Now, before we look at some of the problems you describe, I would first like to try to communicate what Han is is because even its wikipedia page says han is something indescribable along those lines there might be listeners people out there that don't have any understanding of what han is it might be the first time that they're hearing it so minsu can you give us han 101 what is han absolutely and i will but before i do uh mm -hmm. just a disclaimer yeah okay? Uh, I want to make it abundantly clear uh, from the start that I am not one of the yet another one of those peddlers of the concept of Han, okay. right? And here's this, I, you know, mystical idea that's uh, with which you can unlock the doors of the mysteries of uh, of Korea and the Korean character. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's a reason why I called my essay "The Problem with Han." Um, mm. That, uh, in fact, I, you know, I my all the uh, the scholarship. Uh, that I looked into um, shows very clearly that it is a kind of a fictional concept that was invented entirely in the 20th century. Um, mm. And it is at worst a mystical orientalist concept that would uh, that is completely uh, empty in itself. Um, and so part of my uh, essay was about uh, trying to um, figure out where it came from, why it had such a hold um, for a long time in the Korean imagination. Mm. In a way it doesn't anymore. Uh, but oddly, it does uh, in Korean American community, where it has become a kind of a, a major concept that pe people deal with a lot. Right. Uh, mm. So I just want to make that clear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so now, um, so I think in order to define Han, so 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 what it, what is this sort of fictional historical con uh, uh, construct uh, that had such an impact? Um, mm. I think there's at least uh, there's uh, no less than three different elements to it, and. Uh, um, and they all have to be considered in total uh, in order to get a full understanding of this idea. Um, the first is this notion of um, deep-seated sorrow, resentment, anger, um, regret, um, and all of these negative emotions that could result from deeply traumatic events, mm -hmm. uh, frustrated ambitions, and just not having been able to fulfill your destiny um, and and serious, you know, uh, mental and physical violence that have been inflicted on you that gets really, really deep into your soul and uh, uh, and just um, ch changes you and sort of becomes what you, what and who you are. Right? Um, now, uh, a lot of people, when I talk about Han, uh, mm. think that that's what Han is. And that's it. I mean, that that's right. all the definition I needed, right? Um, and um, and I've gotten into some very interesting and at times um, fairly perilous discussion where a lot of especially Korean Americans were under the impression that when I say that Han is not real, um, they thought that what I was saying is that the kind of suffering that uh, Koreans underwent and Korean Americans have underwent uh, and the kind of trauma and the kind of um, uh, so the after effects I deal with that none of that is real, right? And I'm like absolutely not. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All that is real. The mm. trauma is real. Uh, the PTSD is real. Um, I believe in intergenerational trauma. Uh, I believe in all of that gets passed down. So that is not what I'm saying at all. I mean, given the kind of, uh, you know, uh, tumultuous history that uh, Korea has gone through in the modern era, I mean, that's that's all absolutely real, right? Mm. But that's not the whole of Han. There are two other elements to Han uh, that you have to consider, right? Because what I just talked about just now, that's just trauma. That's just PTSD. That's just, you know, uh, um, all, all, the, all the kind of things that people could feel uh, from, um, from uh, all the negative emotions that people could feel from having uh, gone through terrible events. Um, mm. Now, the two other elements is this. One is that, so you have this deep-seated notions, uh, deep-seated uh, feelings of sorrow and uh, uh, anger and rage and resentment. Mm. that Han says there's a specific way in which Koreans feel it in a way that no other people feel it. Mm -hmm. right? uh, that there, there's, a, there's a specific way in which the Koreans process their trauma and process their resentment um, it, that is completely unique to the Korean character. Right? Mm. Uh, there I part with. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's where to me it gets a, as a historian and as a Korean, that's where I, I 
the, the whole thing uh, starts shaking to me. But there's a third element to it that I find even more, uh, even more, um, uh, even uh, even more skepticism inducing, not not to say risible, right? That um, that that is what Korean character is, in its essence, right? Um, that Han is the Korean national character. And that Korean national character is Han, that if you want to ever, ever truly understand what it is like to be Korean, you have to understand Han. But then they flip it around, say, if you're not Korean, you'll never understand Han. Right. Right? So that, in a certain sense, completely isolates the Korean's character from ever being be able to fully understood by non-Koreans, right? Mm. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, so look, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, in my discussions about this, I, I'm kind of sick of having to defend myself, saying that I'm not saying trauma is not real. Right. I'm not saying that Koreans have suffered terribly, and the after effects of that is still very much present in South Korea itself and uh, in, in in the Korean American community and so on. Um, that's all real. Um, where I part company with, as I said, is sort of this uniqueness of mm. uh, you know of the Korean way of processing uh, trauma and that also that that makes us somehow uh, somehow special and different from everybody else right um so um so i so what my essay was about i, I was trying to trace it back to where it came from and how such an idea got developed mm -hmm. so that tripart explanation of han i think is really good just before we get into your own personal explorations of han it, one of the things that I often see is that it's deep seated, it's deep rooted. That's always in the definitions of hand that it's sort of buried deep. It, it doesn't um, exist or manifest on the surface level. But it, do you have any observation of why it's always this deep seated, deep rooted, like stuck down into the core of the being? Is there right. any linguistic uh, reason for that or philosophical reason why it's always focused on as being so deep? Well, I, I think that that really does. Uh, I mean, I, again, I, I do believe that that is real mm. uh, because it's in direct uh, reaction to the really death of horrors that has that was visited upon Korea uh, in the course of the 20th century. I yeah. mean, that that's that's absolutely there. And and this feeling that that is so um, uh, there's so so seeped in, uh, into the very um, soul of uh, individual human beings, the people as whole. Um, I absolutely believe that that is what it feels like. Mm. Um, that is absolutely what it feels like. And uh, um, and so, so I mean, to answer your question, I think it's indirect. Uh, you know, I mean, the uh, the deepness of it is in direct response to the levels of horrors that uh, that the people have uh, experienced, right? But but here's again, um, is the death of the horrors that was visited on, say, the Jewish people through the Holocaust, is that so different? Mm, yeah. No, I and I understand. Is that something completely different? Right? Yeah. And that's the that second and third point that you mentioned that mm. it's this Han is unique to Koreans, but other people can never understand it, and so it right. delves into perhaps Orientalism and such forth. Um, what we'll we'll try to unpack that as we go along. But if I can ask you, Minsu, how did you get? into the concept of Han? Like what drew you to these conversations where you were having to defend yourself and, and coming yeah. against people peddling Han as such? Like what was your journey into the study and discussions of Han? Right, um, great, yeah. Um, so uh, as a academic historian, my research track kind of went on an unusual path, right? Um, <laughs> so my, right. my training is in um, European history in the uh, 18th and 19th century and um, and after I spent many, many years writing my first uh, 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 book on the history of automata and um, and and getting tenure, um, and as it also, you know happens a lot with professors who just got tenure, uh, I said my next project is going to do some. I'm going to do something fun. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Not that the uh, past project wasn't fun, but it was just too you know I mean, it was just too felt too much like work at the end and and all the stress that comes from trying to get tenure and all of that, right? Um, so, um, and for reasons that I could get into later, if you're interested, I, um, I got into a topic of doing a new translation of the uh, uh, classic Korean novel, Hong Gil Tong Chan, uh, the story of Hong Gil Tong, mm, um, right. which, uh, which I felt that needed a completely new translation. And that set me on a completely different trajectory where I ended up uh, translating multiple classic Korean novels and 
Uh, and then I started doing, uh, then I started really ha having to learn myself, uh, I mean, learn, um, you know, um, pre-modern Korean. And, um, and as a result of doing all of that research, um, mm. I've had to uh, start visiting Korea a lot, uh, in order to consult with, to, to research and consult with professors who are experts in that area. Um, and so this was, um, this was about 10 years ago, when I noticed something interesting that um, in America, um, when I read writings by Korean Americans, uh, memoirs, novels, essays, and so on, mm. they talked about they started talking about Han a lot, right? Um, and you know, and and their their audience since they're writing in English, their audience is mostly you know um, American readers, so they say, well, this is concept in Korean, and, and you know, and this and they they would define it in all kinds of ways, mm. and um, and I just had this weird. I mean, of course, from growing up in Korea, I, I knew what Han was. I mean, all Koreans do. And um, and I was like, wow, Han, I haven't heard about that in a long time. That's that's odd. I mean, that's really odd that that I'm... Mean, so um, just out of curiosity, when I started visiting Korea and I started talking with, um, uh, you know, professors who are experts in, you know, uh, in Korean culture and literature and so on, I, I mentioned that. And, you know, it was interesting because I got a lot of eye rolling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh hot mm. i mean that's that's so 80s that's so 70s right um mm. and i realized that in fact in south korea itself the idea is completely passe nobody's really talking about it. it's not seen as a you know a significant cultural uh you know idea at all so there was so i mean i got interested in sort of this weird this uh this juncture. i mean it's it's out in south korea and mm. in, in, in america among korean americans it's being sort of revived and uh, in in you know in ways that were I you know I I something to find out completely different from the way it was. Um, so um, I while I was doing my main research on classic Korean novels and uh, and all that, I sort of casually started gathering materials with the with the idea in the back of my head about maybe I'll write an article about this at one point, a scholarly article. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so I found out um, through my research what you know, where, uh, to my complete so, uh, an appalled surprise that, um, which I shouldn't have been surprised that it actually doesn't come from Korean tradition at all. It comes from Japanese imperial ideology, and I saw it being implicated in ethno nationalism after independence, and also in sexist reaction against uh, the expansion of women's rights and so on. Um, and so uh, after I, I came back and while I was winding up my project on uh, classic Korean novels, um, when I started thinking about writing an academic article, uh, mm. I found that there's already one written in English. Um, and it was written by this, you know, I, it's this really good article uh, um, uh, uh, by uh, Sandra Kim. And it was published in uh, Korea, uh, Korean Studies in 2017. And uh, um, and it was one of those things where I read it and it's like I okay it, it covered pretty much everything that I re uh, researched so I don't I don't actually need to write a full on academic article mm. except there were just two things that were that surprised me <laughs> right uh, one is that she um, the scholar I mean the, the essay is wonderful it's it's actually really really well written and it's uh, uh, it's good but um, she did not deal with the gender angle at all. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, you know, so um, so I mean, to to me, one of the one of the most glaring things about its uh, its role in the discourse about gender uh, in South Korea, and the, especially in the seventies and eighties. Um, and the other uh, and the other thing that that surprised me is that after she found out all of these aspects about you know problematic aspects about Han, its origin in Japanese ideology, um, mm. she came to the conclusion that it's still a useful idea. Han is still a useful idea to think about. Korean experience of trauma and all that, right? And and uh, uh, you know, look, I, I'm about to give you like a completely unfair, cartoonish version of an argument, but I, I can't, you know, I can't, mm. I can't go into all the details. But uh, ultimately, what she, she seemed to be saying is that if enough people think it's real and it feels real, then we have to treat it as real. Right? And uh, and I uh, I have a problem with that. Um, and I, you know, I, I think we can treat, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I agree with her that just because an idea is not real doesn't mean that it doesn't have, you know, massive impact, mm. uh, and history. Like, uh, I don't know, well, be, um, you know, American concept of, uh, manifest destiny, right? Oh, uh, God, maybe I mean, something like that religion. Well, yeah, yeah. For, for non-believers, I mean, even all mm. religions would be, you know, uh, I mean, it has a real impact, right? Um, yeah. But uh, that's a completely different question um, as uh, from whether from the scholarship it's, it should be uh, considered something um, something uh, 
uh, I mean, actually real. And the problem with that is that, um, I mean, I, you know, just, I, I think this, um, you know, when, when, uh, when I start thinking about the kind of answers that I would, uh, you know, I, I mean, to, what, what the kind of things I would talk about in this uh, interview, um, mm. one of the things that occurred to me that maybe, and this is not so much about her article, but maybe my uh, reasons why I have the kind of, why I, why I seem to be taking a much more hard line, line on, hard line on, you know, the reality of Han mm. uh, than she did, which is that, um, I feel that we live in a time right now, in the, mm. in the historical time that we live in, that we can't be lackadaisical about what is real and what is not, and say sort of casual stuff about like if people you know believe it, then it's true, right? Um, like if enough people truly believe that the last presidential election in America was rigged, mm. it, does that make it somehow real, right? Um, I mean, if enough people think that. Uh, COVID and the vaccines are all conspiracy. Um, should we take that, um, you know, uh, should we take that as real uh, and so on? And I, I I, just think that, you know, I mean, now that we live in an age where fascism is on the march again, right? mm. um, we we cannot be that la lackadaisical about this thing. And, uh, you know, God, I actually feel horrible about saying it because I'm not associating her article with, you know, with this crazy conspiracy theories. Mm. And I'm not doing that, right? It's just that, I'm, I'm saying, I think I'm saying more about myself, about why, uh, you know, as a historian um, who I, and I, by the way, I, I, I teach an entire class on historical myths. So an entire class on just wrong things people believe, uh, believe about the history. And one of the things I spent a great deal of time on is hmm. why, not, not just that these things are wrong, but like hugely negative impact that these ideas had had because of these false ideas about, uh, about history. Um, and so, um, so I, so, but, you know, but the thing is, though, I mean, she did uh, such a good job, uh, you know, in a scholarly article, uh, laying things out that I, I felt that I, I mean, at best, I would, I would need to write an essay addressing sort of what I disagree with her about in a more like popular essay. Um, mm -hmm. But I set that aside because, uh, precisely because I, I had this kind of conversation with Korean Americans about, uh, about my view on this, and I would get very, negative reactions to that um again you know uh, again me saying you know han doesn't you know I, 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 han is not, not real and them interpreting the demean um you know i i get this a lot um i get this a lot from korean americans um they they tell me just absolutely devastating stories about you know um about their experiences um everything from low level racism and not feeling uh you know uh, belonging any uh belonging uh, truly in the community that they grew up in in America and sometimes even just virulent uh, you know and violent uh, mm. experience that they had and feeling displaced feeling alone feeling traumatized and feeling the effects of it and and it be, it affecting their life in a big way right mm. and uh, um, and it um, it was terrible but then she came a uh, she or he would come across this notion of Han and it, it would be revelatory to them, right? Is that yep. this explains what I'm feeling, right? I mean, this this is it, right? I mean, this deep seated, all these feelings that I have. And and also there's an added bonus of saying that this connects you to the people of your ancestry. Mm, right. Uh, I mean, and and that, uh, and I, I think the idea also um, gives them sort of um, a feeling of belongingness to, uh, I mean, and you know, a lot of these uh, Korean Americans I talked to are people who, are, uh, who you know, um, who actually felt alienated from Korean culture in the first place because they didn't really speak Korean, and you know, it's all, all in a very elementary level. But this allow, I mean, their instant recognition of this notion of deep-seated, you know, mm. sorrow and all that uh, inst gave gave them a, a way in which to connect with the land of their ancestry, and also. Um, it made them feel special because this was a because Han says that no other people can feel this, right? Right, and that is tremendously, tremendously powerful. Um, so here I come out. Uh, here I come. I mean, this egghead intellectual is <laughs> saying that. Wait, wait, wait. You know? um, and it seems to them that I'm saying that I don't believe you that you have this trauma. I don't mm. believe you that you went to the, and I uh, and some of those stories were so devastating that I actually just wanted to like hug them and say no, I believe you. 
Right. I believe that you went through all of this and I believe that you're still hurting. Right? And, uh, and I believe you that when you heard about Han, that it's sort of, everything just sort of seemed to come together and said, oh, it makes sense and all that, right? Um, mm. And I, I, and, and I, and I also want to say, and I, I, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about this, that there's a serious mental health implication to this, where I think Han is actually damaging. Mm. That people who would have sought help for the kind of trauma that they may experience, uh, may not because that they feel that as a Korean uh, that they, they are condemned to this, that this is their natural state, that this natural condition. Um, and that's sort of what Han says, right? Um, yeah. And uh, um, so, uh, so and I just, you know, so I, I just want to again, scream over and over again, I believe you mm-hmm. and I know you're hurting and I, I you know, um, and I, I'm not skeptical about that. It's just that this is, this is the wrong concept and it may feel therapeutic, but it isn't. Mm. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it keeps you from true healing by by um, uh, by placing you back in a kind of idea of ethno nationalism that in, in itself is a is, is a kind of empty idea. So um, now a lot of this, uh, I mean, there, there's a uh, there's a, you know, a group in a, a Facebook group um, for Korean Americans in the uh, in the literary um, uh, in the world where. Uh, um, I, I said something like this and it just flared up into a huge, huge, uh, you know, sort of back and forth and all that. Mm. And, uh, and it resulted in, um, one of them writing an actually beautiful, beautiful piece about what Han has meant to them. Um, mm. again, it's just, you know, devastating, you know, uh, um, you know, narrative of, uh, of a kind of, uh, ideas and, um, in which unfortunately I, I without, uh, you know, I was quoted out of context. <laughs> from the postings on Facebook. And yeah, uh, I mean, I, my name wasn't given. Um, no. And, you know, and, and, the, and, and the writing itself was beautiful. So I'm not, I'm not criticizing that, but I just felt that there had to be a piece of writing out there that lays out exactly what I mean about mm. its, you know, wh- the origin of Han, its problematic nature. And ultimately, I mean, ultimately, I mean, this, this what, I, I, what I didn't get to say in this essay that I'm very glad I got the opportunity to say here that ultimately um, believing in Han is not, is not the path toward healing. I get um, the more I listen to you, Min. So I get this idea that Han is the opium of the masses or something. And even after after twenty minutes of listening to you, I don't see you as somebody characterized by Han. Right? You you seem to. I, there's been a big. You said that Han is passe these days. There's been a big yeah. government push, I think, to to replace Han with Hung. This sense of joy. <laughs> they, they're replacing it. There's a new one, right? Um, right, right. There's a lot I want to delve into that you've mentioned, such as the issues of gender, diaspora, mental health, historical myths. Um, one of the ones, if I might ask you, this one is that your article also pointed to lots of recent pieces connected to Hallyu connected to Squid Game or Ojing or Game, mm-hmm. Gisen Chung, Parasite, <clears throat> and people using Han to explain these yeah. Hallyu products. Now, you've said that Korean Americans, excuse me, <clears throat> you've said that Korean Americans, uh, some of them find Han very comforting or a way to describe the tra- the very real trauma they've experienced. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that my international students love Han. Right. They, mm-hmm. they all their essays that they write for me that they've got Han and and they lean on it as well. What do you think the appeal of Han is in terms of when we're trying to explain the recent Hallyu boom? So I just want to get into this one a little bit because you said it's right. a bit passe. But as your article points out, we are seeing it rise up with the success of these dramas and movies, aren't we? Right. Absolutely. Um, and uh, um, so I see it over and over again, you know, mm. on people reviewing Parasite, people reviewing Squid Games and it's said, Han, 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 right? And, yeah. uh, and I'm sitting there, I, I, I don't understand what's Han got to do with any of this. I mean, first of all, the words never mentioned in those, uh, in, in that movie or the show, so uh, mm. a, a, at all, right? Um, and, uh, um, and also there's, um, there's, a, um, there's a very simple way uh, of disproving that Han has anything to do with it. Right, because if, if 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 those shows like Squid Game and you know uh, uh, you know um, Parasite and uh, and now I'm watching the film uh, the TV adaptation of Pachinko from Minjin Lee's uh, mm. wonderful novel. Um, yeah. Um, if if what is an app- operation there is Han is uh, is Han right? Um, non Koreans would not get it. Right. Yeah, but they simple. are getting it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They understand exactly what is going on here, right? I mean, mm. they. I mean, it's like I. Um, 
I mean, they, they, they watched Parasite and they said, oh yeah, this, it's about class conflict. I mean, that, that's a story that anybody living in a capitalist country can understand right away, yeah. right? Um, and, uh, and there's not some mystical Korean, uh, you know, Korean idea behind it that, that you know, unless you're a Korean, you know, you, you have to truly understand all that. Um, but, you know, the thing is though, I mean, this is a, um, so, uh, I mean, okay, the, the, the rudest way <laughs> I could put mm-hmm. it into, the attraction of fun is that um and it's not i mean this this is not this this doesn't apply to everybody who's written about uh it, um that's it's it's orientalist mysticism uh you know at at its most basic level right i mean this yeah. this thing this this you know asiatic idea of this thing you know that, that only these people can you know uh, then feel all that um and uh, um and that's all the attractions of like you know orientalist uh you know fetish objects uh would do um and also, um, you know, I, I mean, a little less rude than that. It seemed to provide a nice um, explanatory concept um, yeah. for uh, for people who actually believe that, you know, cultures, uh, you know, a, essence of different cultures are unique and different from, you know, everything else. And, uh, um, and it consists of a core that only uh, people of that ethnicity can truly understand and so on and so on, right? Uh, and that's, that's you know, I mean, that's, uh, uh, I, I mean, that's, that's a very attractive idea, but it's also a very simple idea, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's an idea that anybody can grasp, right? Yeah. Um, the more difficult one is when you take apart that idea and see that like, you know, like an onion, you peel it and peel it and peel it and you don't get a core, you get nothing. Right. right? Yep. Um, I mean, and, and the, and the, and the peelings are, you know, uh, are sort of the layers of historical context uh, that, uh, that, that does create the onion. Right. But there's no core there. Right? Mm. I've, I've experienced that sometimes. I mean, I've been in Korea nearly 20 years. I have a PhD in Korean studies. And sometimes I'll ask my students just, kind of lightheartedly but can i know han and they'll look at me a little bit and they'll go well the education at the time but no i don't think so david and then i'll ask well what about my children with the, the right. have, and it really it, you can see the gears working of you know that it's almost like a formula that they're doing um with han does this also apply minsu to other things so i just touched on this idea of hung but there's also nunchi nunchi was talked about mm-hmm. as the secret to yes. korean happiness there's jong there's a gungji this kind of strong-willed mm-hmm. one right um yeah. is han different from these is it similar do they all apply across the board yeah um well i mean it had a bigger historical impact than the other ideas uh, because uh, yeah, you know right. I mean, it's like some big names um I mean, the, in the in the culture, like for instance, uh, the now disgraced uh, poet Cohen, mm. uh, he made huge deal out of it all throughout his career as sort of the, uh, the sort of defining idea behind uh, you know uh, Korean literature, and so did the great novelist Park Young Mi, and she uh, she wrote a lot about that and so on. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, so um, so the, yeah, I mean, there, there's whole uh, I mean, the whole uh, uh, array of uh, these words that are seen as special to the language and special to the culture. But um, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, I mean, it's like um, um, you know, I see that all over the place, and uh, and I essentially I, I don't see it as, uh, as as very useful. Like um, I don't know. I mean, it's like um, you know, every every time somebody notices something peculiar or particular to American culture, they immediately jump to r- rugged individualism. Yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, you know, something unique to uh, something that seems unique to Japan. They go, oh, the samurai bushido spirit, right? mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, um, England, the merry England idea, uh, <laughs> you know, idea, right? <laughs> Which we know again, it's, it was constructed during the uh, 19th century uh, Romantic era, right? Um, as, as sort of you know, sort of imposing this kind of pa- uh, utopian view to the past, right? Um, and at the end, they all boil boil down to that, but um, but you know. Uh, Okay, I, I have to be a little bit careful here because mm. I, I uh, there's there's a uh, writer who's uh, who, who I need to protect. But um, okay, so here's what I say. Um, one one the reasons why this is happening is that um, publication industry have made a lot of money out of writing these sort of self help book. Mm-hmm based on words that are supposedly un- untranslatable from a mm. bunch of different languages. Right. Right. That's a pedaling, um, I think, that you yeah. mentioned. Um, yeah. And I've heard of 
editor is actually Googling, you know, in this, is there like a untranslable word in this, in this language? And, uh, and they, they've had very successful books uh, mm. and it's become a genre. It's, it's become a genre. Um, and, uh, and uh, I mean, you know, and, but the thing is, I mean, all of these words, if you look, if you go to like a, um, uh, a real linguist, uh, ling uh, li uh, linguistics expert and look at the word, they go, no, I mean, they're making a huge big deal out of, uh, look, I, he here's the thing. Um, look, every, every, every language have a word uh, concepts that can't be really translated into another word, but here's, um, but like, for instance, um, you know, the German word schadenfreude, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, feeling joy at <laughs> the yeah. misfortune of others, right? It's very um, German, isn't it? <laughs> it? Well, it is, um, but at the same time, um, no, a language, uh, an exact word like that does not exist in the English language, but at the same time, once you explain it, people go, aha, yeah, you know, and, and therefore people just uh, just use that word schadenfreude, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and so on, right? Um, and that's fine, that's fine, but... Um, Here's where I get in. I mean, it would be problematic if somebody said, "Yeah, you just I, I explained what Schadenfreude to you, and you understood it." But if I were to say only a German could possibly feel Schadenfreude, you go, "What?" I mean, I just understood it, right? Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you know. I mean, you, you, you're talking about your conversation with your students. I, I had a number of uh, you know. Uh, uh, non-Koreans who are specialists in Korean culture, uh, who, who who lived in Korea and all that, they uh, they told me that there's the, of getting into a situation where some, you mention Han and they say, well, um, you know, uh, you know, and 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 the Korean says, well, what do you think it is? And they, and they explain it and say, no, 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 you don't get it because you're a foreigner. Mm. And here's what this really is, and it's, it's they say exactly the same thing. Yep. Yeah, is that? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, slightly different words. Schadenfreude is a great example. I, I think of that means to. Now, I'll try to ask this question respectfully. Um, uh, but we do see a whole publication industry with books and also with articles in respected sort of news and media outlets where they'll point to these things about Nun Tian Han and also things from Japan as well. I, I don't see them coming out about England and France as much, but that might just be a confirmation bias on my part. So what I want to try to ask here, Minsu, is that does this generally, is there something tied to the geographic region because it's Northeast Asia? Is it tied to the fact that these are sometimes um, more homogenous societies, also mm -hmm. societies that are based on a, a form of ethno-nationalism that does exist, although mm -hmm. it's dying down, the Tanil Minjok and such forth. Is there any reason why I see them as coming out of Korea and Japan, but not mm -hmm. so much coming out of Belgium? or mm -hmm. Luxembourg, is, it, is, is that just publishing? Is that just capitalism? Is that confirmation bias? Or is there something in the uh, genetic, the, the multiculturalism or lack thereof? Right, well, I, well, I think in, uh, in terms of the Western media market, um, mm. I, um, I think there's too many people who already speak English and French to be, uh, to, to be able to fake that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean there's just, just too many people who know French so that if you just pull some obscure French word out, uh, you know, for, the, for, their to, uh, for which there's no exact equivalent of the other language and people will call them on it, right? Uh, but um, there's still, you know, th not that many people who, uh, who understand Korean um, and, you know, and, uh, and um, I mean, that's, that's of course changing thanks to, you know, the popularity of uh, Korean uh, popular mm. culture. I mean, there's lots of people, lots of young people who are interested in learning Korean and all that, but, but still the numbers of it is limited. So it's easier to fake that kind of thing when it's, it's, it's a fairly obscure language and obscure culture. And, and again, I, I hate to keep returning to this, but also it's, it's also, again, once again, Orientalist mysticism. Mm. You know, the, it's it's sort of the othering of these people over there whose culture is so vastly different and whose mentality is so different. And, you know, um, and all of that difference is, uh, you know, represented by this one word um, that's, that seems to be, you know, that has no Eng uh, English equivalent and that's, that goes directly to what makes them so unique and different and all of that. When... Uh, at the end, at the end of it, you you get down to it, and it's say, like, well, I, you know, I mean, especially when it's about suffering. And as I said, I I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, yes, Koreans have suffered a lot, but I don't know 
how different this is from Jewish survivors of the Holocaust or Rwanda survivors of the Civil War there, or uh, what the Ukrainians are going through right now. Um, I, I mean, the thing is, like, I mean, it's um, when you, when you when you're an academic historian, unfortunately, I mean, well, I don't have to want, unfortunately, but um, you sort of automatically become an expert on universal suffering. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the horrors of that, I mean, what, I, what, one of the real horrors of existence is, in fact, how not special any of that is. That I mean, you know, after having spent my entire life reading about one war after another, one lost cause after another, you know, civilization being built and then being destroyed and all of that, right? And um, and the the universality of that kind of suffering is just what I get slapped with and over and over and over again. So mm. um, so when I when I see you know a, a group of people, where, uh, Koreans or whoever, right, uh, who mm. suffered terribly, who suffered like gone through horrible things, and they they say that we have suffered um, and we have suffered like nobody else has suffered. I said I I understand what you mean, <laughs> and I. I mean, just because I think you're wrong mm. doesn't mean that I don't have the utmost empathy and uh, and um, and and you know for what you've gone through. Um, I mean, it's it's a terrible thing, but it's um, human history is terrible and it's universal and it's it's just wow. I'm down with this dark. <laughs> yeah, no. Put myself uh... in the dark. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right, Minsu. And I, I think the more we understand other countries' conflicts and sufferings and traumas, we realize that it wasn't, we become a little bit that frog in the well or things like that. I've, I, I've noticed, for example, the, the lack of understanding sometimes in England as well, but in Korea of Vietnam sufferings uh, of China and such forth, that there's such a focus on one's own history irrespective of what country that you're in. Um, Han is really tied to history, so maybe I might just ask you about this now, Minsu, because your article points to the imperialism, the colonization, the, the, the division of the people, the subsequent civil war, everything that's been uh, carried out upon the Korean people. And what's your observation? So you've spoken about this universal history. Mm -hmm. People and scholars will, or um, opinion writers will talk to Han coming out of this uh, very turbulent and tragic Korean history in the mm -hmm. late 19th, right. 20th century. Uh, how do you understand this connection between history, South Korea's specific history, and Han? Right. Um, so, um, so it goes up and down. I mean, so the so Han becoming important and then less important, and then it's becoming important again, and so on. Right. Um, mm. So, um, so when I embarked on the research on the origins of Han, um, um, what you know, one of the truly appalling things that I found out is that it's it does not come from Korean tradition at all. Um, you will find zero zero evidence that any Korean prior to the 20th century thought that Han was some kind, had some kind of significant. Uh, you know, a significance to a Korean culture, and uh, not one. It was actually, a, I mean, you know, the the uh, the word itself coming from uh, uh, you know, of Chinese origin, Han. Um, mm. It was it was fairly obscure. I mean, I mean, it does appear, but you know, but you don't have any Joseon Dynasty uh, person saying, you know, we are defined by Han. Um, it's all modernity, um, and mm. it's especially appalling to find out that it begins Japanese imperial, uh, you know, ideology, not from Korean tradition. Um, mm. So, um, in it, uh, so one, so when uh, the Japanese colonized Korea, um, um, one of the ways in which it solidified, tried to solidify its position here, was to introduce an ideology that justified the Japanese domination of the Korean Peninsula. Um, and this ideology is, uh, is known as Naisen Itai, which literally translates into Japan and Korea, one body. Japan, mm -hmm. you know, so Japan and Korea, are, you know, are one, right? Uh, and it's it's based on a historical myth that they constructed, um, which in which the narrative goes something like this. Um, Japan um, went through all the natural process processes of a development of a civilization from, you know, small village culture to a kingdom and all that now to modernity. And now it's it's a powerful country with, you know, uh, with modern technology, uh, modern government, and all that. Um, mm. Now, Koreans, uh, ethnically, uh, according to this myth, uh, the same people as the Japanese, except they had the misfortune of being on a peninsula that's attached to China. And as a result, its growth toward 
the ultimate form of enlightened modern nation was stunted and prevented uh, by a combination of domination of uh, Chinese um, uh, culture and the utter corruption of the ruling class, right? Mm. So according to uh, Naisen and Itai, the Japanese are coming to rescue the Korean people from their own corrupt, incompetent leaders um, and sort of helping them, you know, uh, you know, uh, helping them um, uh, uh, reach the level of civilization, right? Uh, now that all sounds very benevolent, right? But it became the central ideology with which to perpetrate like the worst kinds of forms of racism and racial oppression that, you know, and colonial oppression that one can imagine. Um, now, coupled with this idea, um, you know, um, was, is the, uh, it was the notion of what is called um, the beauty of sorrow, um, which uh, was, uh, uh, was created by a, uh, a Japanese artist, artist named uh, Yanagi uh, Muneyoshi. Um, and, um, and he is, um, I, you know, he's, a, he's actually a really interesting figure. Um, I, you know, I, um, I would say like, he's the Japanese William Morris, mm -hmm. okay. right? In the sense that um, he was, he did not like modernity. It was back to basics. Um, and he, um, and he, he felt that modernity has sort of ruined something really essential and beautiful uh, in the primitive art and culture of, of, of the Japanese. Um, and, uh, um, but he felt that in Korea that was preserved, but precisely because of the backwardness of Korea, uh, the, 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 the beautiful primitive was still there. Um, and so he praised um, not high Korean art, which was, you know, uh, just basically, you know, uh, from his point of view and from the point of view of a lot of Japanese, just imitation of uh, uh, Chinese art, but uh, basic arts and crafts, right? Mm -hmm. Like like pottery and so on, right? Um, and in his description of the of this beauty, he, he was the one who uh, basically invented the notion that's going to get labeled as hot, which is that the Koreans are deeply, deeply, deeply sorrowful people precisely because of the oppression of its corrupt rulers and its backwardness and its poverty and all of that. And, and that's, that's what characterizes them. There's sort of this uniqueness, uniqueness to the beauty of the sorrow that they poured into this art. And, and if you want to understand Korean character, you have to understand that mm. essentially sorrowful nature, right? This is exactly what just the sun. Um, now, the thing is, <laughs> Although um, Yanagi Muneyoshi was was a was a really really um, virulent um, anti-imperialist, uh, he didn't he did not like uh, the Japanese co uh, co uh, colonization of Korea, but he inadvertently gave uh, uh, made a huge contribution to the Nice Anitai ideology by mm -hmm. um, giving the Japanese ideology of notion of oh these poor primitive savage Koreans I mean you know I mean so filled with sorrow at all of the sufferings and um, you know, that, 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 that they've gone through um, and so um, oh, so that, that's and, and in, a, in a certain sense um, to use a you know much used words now gaslighting mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, they managed to convince you know a lot of Koreans that this this is why your country sucks so much and your culture so uh, you know backward and why, you know, um, why you need us, why you need us to, you know, uh, civilize you and modernize you. Um, now, here's what, what's interesting. So you would think that once the Japanese left and Korea became independent, um, that, um, that in the new hopeful era of, uh, of independence, that people would utterly reject that. Mm. Right? Yeah. Because it's, it's just so full of, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, contemptuous. I mean, even, in the, even the benevolence is sort of like a kind of, you know, uh, contemptuous benevolence and so on. Um, but uh, but Korean nationalists took it up. Uh, they took up the idea um, and attached the word Han to it because um, there is a one, sec uh, one part of this Japanese imperial ideology that Korean nationalists absolutely agreed with, which was that the Joseon dynasty rule was corrupt. Mm. It, it, it was tyrannical. Um, and it uh, and it it was to be holden to Chinese culture and uh, and and and, um, and and Chinese uh, arts and so on. Um, and uh, and because um, you know uh, Korean nationalists were not they were not, they were not advocating for a return to the old Joseon dynasty order. Uh, that's all gone, and now we need to construct a whole new modernity. So this became a good tool for which to uh, to explain why we shouldn't go back, that we need to go forward, right? 
And, uh, um, and then, uh, so the idea of, uh, so yes, we are a people of profound sorrow. We are a people of Han, um, and we need to overcome it through modernity, right? Um, so at first, there was this sort of rhetoric of overcoming Han, right? Um, in, in Korean, it's, it's, um, it's described as the, uh, the untying of Han, right? Mm -hmm. Han will pull that, right? It mm. means untying, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but then, uh, once um, the so-called, you know, economic miracle of South Korea got going, um, it was it was transformed into an idea of Korean specialness. Um, what makes us different and special, and why you know um, you know and, uh, and and what what makes our art so profoundly beautiful and sorrowful and uh, and so on. So um, so it's interesting to me. So it it began as a Japanese way of denigrating Koreans, but mm. it was it the idea got flipped around to talk about this is what makes us special. Look what we have endure, endured. Um, look what, you know, I mean, the, the, the absolute resilience with which we went through this and survived and, and now we're thriving, right? Yeah. Um, but, deep, uh, but deep within it, there's this thing that makes us different. And that, that, that's why uh, Koreans are able to do this where, you know, we have to reconstruct our country and, uh, and uh, build a brand new modern culture uh, that is modern and, you know, technological and hopefully, you know, bring prosperity. Right? Um, so that, so that, so that part is, I, I mean, that, 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 um, that like ad adoption of Japanese idea, Japanese imperial ideology and flipping it around mm. and then using it for ethno-nationalist purpose. I mean, for, for historians, it's completely fascinating. Right? Uh, it, it's, I mean, that's one of the more fascinating aspects of, um, you know, how these ideas get used. I like I like Minsu the idea that uh, Yanagashi oh, Yanagi Muniyoshi he was talking about the the tragedy and the sadness of the Joseon ruling class during that period. But when I, I, as, as I understand it, then when the Korean nationalists adopt Han, mm -hmm. they're talking about the tragedy of not the Joseon dynasty, but rather the colon, uh, colonial period, aren't they? So there's uh, also have they changed the object of it? Am I? Oh, no, no, actually, Yanagi was talking about the common people, right? Okay. Uh, you know, ab about the sadness that it, I mean, so, so he had, you know, small groups of, you know, royalty and aristocracy who were living it up and all of mm. that and kowtowing to the Chinese. And, but the vast majority of Koreans are suffering terribly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, and, um, and then the nationalist goes, yes, that's exactly right. That's, <laughs> that's what happened. And that's why this is well of sadness uh, within the Korean character. How, it, that makes that makes sense yes how did those korean nationalists manifest this new idea of han so you spoke about hanul tulda or this untying of han but then also your article points to han becoming an important cultural concept in the 1960s and it, mm -hmm. it, it you know it it's interesting how it goes up and down over time it, it, it's kind right. of this omnipresent but it, it rises and falls when uh these nationalists or, or various korean people were trying to uh, reintroduce Han or use Han as a symbol of the Korean people in its own journey towards modernity. How did it manifest? Was it coming out in the daily speech of the people? Because you said Han is not mentioned in Parasite or Squid Game. It, it's not said. So was it coming out in art? Was it coming out in government proclamations? Was it coming out in the newspaper? Yeah, um, yeah um, it becomes really ub uh, ubiquitous um, in cultural outpourings, in fiction, um, in, uh, in essays that talks about state of Korea, uh, in film. Um, and, mm. I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, Seopyeon yeah. uh, you know, a, a bit, which is like the quintessential Han, uh, informed films. Um, and, uh, um, and it shows up in, even in school exams about, you know, you know, uh, you know, about the definition of Han and what you, what you should be thinking about it. So, and, we, and as I said, we get really, really, you know, uh, important figures in Korean literature like Goen and Park kyung you know, making a huge deal about it. And as a result, um, it, I mean, so it's largely through culture. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I do it through, uh, you know, I do see it through uh, political proclamation and so on. But much of it is like, you know, where the general public gets consumes culture, like in TV dramas and in mm. movies and in popular novels and so on, right? Uh, it's Han, 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 Han all the time, right? Um, and uh, um, and so um, you, so um, I mean, you know, a lot of it because a lot of Korean dramas um, and uh, um, and Korean movies and Korean novels are historical in nature. Um, 
and uh, uh, and so they sort of inevitably have to revisit the traumas of the recent past. Um, well, not so recent, but you know, I mean, the collapse of the kingdom, and I mean, so even in uh, collapse of the kingdom and you know, colonization and the Korean War and division um, and all of that, right? Um, and so, um, so there, there's lot, this lot for Koreans to sort of like narrate, you know, uh, about the uh, the the, uh, the sufferings in the modern era. And when they do, Han just appears inevitably, just mm. boom, 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 right? Um, and uh, um, and I, I think um, much more than through a political, um, you know, uh, p- uh, political um, uh, communiques or um, uh, or or you know academic writings i think it's through popular culture mm-hmm. that han really gets disseminated um as sort of the, the the notion that this is what makes us you know uh, makes us makes koreans you know quintessentially korean it gets disseminated but it also resonates with the people because writers and artists they can try to <clears throat> disseminate ideas but if there's not a receptive population if there's not people that would take it up that idea would just get lost into the ether, wouldn't it? It would just fade. But right. Han really did seem to resonate for some time, though. And you talk about the, the 1993 movie Sopyeonje uh, from Im Kwon Nim, which mm-hmm. I think is a really interesting film. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm understanding it through the idea of Han, but, but the Han Zori and that relationship between traditionalism and modernity, mm-hmm. I, I think is fascinating. You call this in your article... So Pyeonje is the last hurrah of Han. Mm-hmm. It's its right. final farewell uh, right. on the stage. Would you just like to tell us how Han is working in that movie, why it's the goodbye, and how you understand So Pyeonje in the in the story of Han? Right. Um, it it is a summit because I um, so um, it was when it came out. It became the highest gross gross uh, mm. grossing uh, dom- domestically grossing film of all time. Yeah. Um, people saw it, you know, many, many times. Um, didn't really succeed outside of Korea, despite concerted government effort to, you know, introduce it <laughs> in many different festivals and, you know, uh, putting up for awards and all that. Um, gonna have to wait any more years <laughs> until Parasite does it. Um, and uh, um, and it's interesting that it's after it reached the summit. Um, it is afterwards that the cultural importance of Han starts fading away in South Korea. And then when we enter into the new millennium, it becomes increasingly insignificant, right? Um, so, okay, so here's my take on something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? uh, all right. Um, it's, uh, I find it, I mean, I saw it recently, you know, right before I wrote this uh, essay. Uh, I mean, I've seen it, you know, uh, several times before it. Um, upon my new review, uh, uh, viewing it, I find it to be a monstrous film um, in a uh, number of different ways. Um, it's, uh, and it embodies everything about Han that we should be rejecting, and the whole thing should be. Uh, I mean, it's 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 just horrifying. Um, and I'll I'll, I'll uh, but I'll begin by saying what I like about it. Right, uh, mm-hmm. the directing is beautiful. I, I mean, just some of the most stunning scenes I have ever seen in Korean cinema. Um, and. Boy, the singing, I, I forgot her name, but the real Pansori uh, singer who uh, who played the daughter. Uh, oh, oh, just heartbreaking. I mean, it's yeah. just, um, and it, it, it's um, it's it's fantastic. I, I mean, the, the singing was unbelievable and um, the directing was fantastic. The cinema photography, it's, um, it's uh, I mean, although, I mean, in a certain sense, it's all the more problematic because it's such a well-made movie. It's such a gorgeous film, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if it was, if it was not, the ideological thing would not be. I mean, I mean, the same way, like um, I don't know, um, Triumph of the Will is like a beautifully shot film, uh, you know, dedicated to you know uh, uh, a, a horrific ideology. Uh, I'm not saying, in God's case, I'm not comparing it to uh, Lenny Lichtenstein. No, I'm just making a point, right? right? This, right. This, this is a beautifully constructed uh, film itself and the ideology that it serves. And the two are different things, right? Um, yeah. Here's what I find really, really problematic. Um, it's about, it's uh, it, at a time in the 90s when uh, South Korea has reached uh, a point of prosperity and democracy and all that. Um, it is a, a movie that tries to really talk about lost tradition, the beauty of lost tradition, right? Um, so, you have a portrayal of Korea, so Korean society just changing, uh, you know, constantly. And then there's this beautiful traditional art, right? Um, 
and uh, and the uh, the father, the the Pansori uh, uh, artist, um, is constantly talking about Han. It's Han, mm. Han, 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 right? Um, but um, but once you pay attention to what he actually says and what he actually does about it, is that he thinks that like I have a daughter who's got a lot of natural talent, uh, but she's not. She can't take that one leap forward to becoming the ultimate artist of Pansori mm. because she does not have enough Han, mm. right? She needs more sorrow deep in her life to be able to get to the depth of suffering that will make her into like the greatest Pansori singer. So I'm going to blind her. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy her life until becomes, she becomes so unhappy that mm. she can absolutely... Um, I call it a patriarchal horror story. This is yeah. a horror movie about uh, about patriarchy um, and about the use of Han as uh, uh, you know um, to justify child abuse. It's it's a it's a it's a movie that justifies child abuse using this incredibly problematic uh, notion of Han, right? And there's also a bunch of things that are just absolutely wrong about it. Number one, um, there's now been a lot of research done about about pansori as a genre itself and historians have completely blown up that idea that this is a traditional art form uh pansori of a kind did exist during the Joseon dynasty but mm. this thing where like this individual great singer go do like a performance that's hours long and you know with with, with set you know uh, you know storyline and all that that was entirely constructed in the 20th century so pansori is a modern form, mm. right? Or, or rather, the, the type of pansori that's being uh, depicted in the movie that was that was another entirely uh, you know a, a, a genre that was uh, a, a, an art form that was entirely reconstructed in the twentieth century, right? So so this idea that this is some kind of a uh, and as uh, you know some kind of tra tra traditional art form that he's defending is uh, it's it's completely nonsense. Um, but the other thing that I uh, that I really, really, uh, I mean, this, this is actually coming from me as a historian of Europe, right? Yeah. Um, that entire depiction of what is a what is a great artist does not come from Korean tradition, but it comes from early nineteenth century European Romanticism, right? Uh, the lone artist who suffers and terribly, I mean, it's and and who's able to transform his suffering into great art. Um, and uh, um, and this is Byron, this is Shelley, you know, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, um, Coleridge and all of that. And um, there's not, I mean, there's nothing like the no, that kind of notion of genius um, in Korean, in traditional Korean culture, right? So here's a movie that tr that supposedly defends all Korean tradition way. And I know that especially the uh, especially German Romanticism uh, was was huge among uh, European and uh, I mean, Korean intellectuals, um, and it's obviously that notion that was borrowed from that. And so what I see th when I see this guy and his aesthetics, right? This is this is just a Korean version of a European, uh, you know, a, a genius figure who's also trying to make that kind of uh, make his daughter into that kind of uh, kind of genius, right? Um, so, so the whole thing about the uh, about using pansori defend traditional Korean, it's it's all completely fraudulent, right? Mm. Um, and there's even one aesthetic thing that happens uh, at the end of the movie that, to me, is um, that I, I didn't notice it the first time I, uh, I you know I saw the movie, but uh, this time I noticed it and I actually burst out laughing. Um, so toward the end of the scene, after he he basically destroys his uh, you know daughter's life, you know, to turn her into his image of what a great um, uh, you know, artist supposed to be. Um, she, uh, but by that time, by the time she does become a great artist, nobody in Korea, give, well, nobody in Korea gives a shit about Pansori. Right. <laughs> she's living this ordinary life in the countryside, and uh, and she's a she's blind, you know, and she's um, and she comes across uh, her brother finds her, and they do this one great performance, yeah. right? And in the movie, that's that's the climax, right? The the perfect performance. Um, and again, this, I mean, the performance is so perfect that that, in a certain sense, justify this horrific child abuse that was perpetrated uh, on her, right? Um, but notice what happens at the end. So she's singing and the singing is heartbreaking. It's unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, her singing is volume is toned down. And in the background mm. is Western style music on a synthesizer. 
I didn't notice that when I watched it. Um, and I'm like, what? And I actually laughed out loud, right? This movie that tr- uh, that that is about different tradition, the beauty of tradition, the beauty of Han, and all of that. Mm. And the what they do at the end is in order to move the audience. They use synthesizer music. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, this is the 90s, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's what they the use, yeah. Music. Yeah, um, and so, um, and that to me revealed the, the awfully fraudulent nature of, of, uh, of you know, of, of what this uh, movie purports to be about. And that goes directly into, once again, Han itself being a modern construct that, that people um, use for this purpose. Um, and um, and I, I think this directly goes into um, what, what is like, um, you know, I, I think for a lot of feminists would be like the deeply, deeply troubling and frustrating thing about the daughter because mm. it's a daughter who never complains. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's a nice way to get us into this gender issue. But just to stay on Sopion J one one minute, because the, the, the didactic or the moral message of that movie it shocks my students when I tell them about it, that, yeah, this is a father that, that makes his daughter go blind so that she can suffer, so that she can perform well. And I find that in a lot of Korean media and movies where, you know, suicide is seen as a noble act. A lot of Korean movies end with a protagonist uh, committing suicide. And to me, that's weird because I'm, I'm used to seeing the protagonist, like, save the day and kiss the girl and ride off into the sunset. In the Korean, yeah. it, it took me a lot of time to realize, wow, this is sometimes what Korean people expect to see as the culmination of their art and their movies and their culture. Mm-hmm. And like you say, yeah. So Pyonjae really resonated. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit scared about asking this question, but while I have you here. When I look at Sop Pyonjae, I've felt it, and some of my students, they, it might be ethnocentrism, but they tie it into the American blues movement. <laughs> this yeah, idea sure. of slavery and, and the music came through the suffering and, you know, whether it's T-Bone Walker or B.B. Or King or to play the blues, you've, you've got to have the blues. You've got to feel the blues. You talked about the universality and in, in Ger- German 19th century literature and so on. Do you see any connection there with that musical aspect? The, 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 Korea was a slave society as well at that time, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Any connection there, Minsu, or anything to comment on it? Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, in a very general way, that to me that makes perfect sense um, of, um, you know, the, the, the art of the oppressed, um, mm-hmm. the art of those who, um, um, the, you know, the, uh, those who suffered and those who were subject to tyranny, um, and uh, it coming out into sort of this deeply felt aesthetic and. Uh, and you know what, I, I don't think, um, you know, the comparison between, you know, the kind of uh, uh, the pansory performance um, and people thinking about Han in connection to um, uh, the Korean aesthetics and things like blue, the, the, like the blues. Um, that to me, that makes perfect sense. Um, and ironically, uh, that again shows me that sort of this supposed uniqueness and you know uh, uniqueness of the Han experience is is nonsense. Mm. Right. I mean, the, the universality itself speaks to, uh, you know, uh, uh, speaks to the uh, I mean, the conne- I'm, I'm sorry, the, the connection itself and the and the apt conspa- uh, comparison, you know, uh, between these aesthetics uh, of suffering um, that points to the uh, the universality of all of this. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I think the comparison is very apt. Uh, it makes perfect sense to me. But I, I but uh, I think um, I mean, but I, I think what's ironic is that a lot of people who try to explain Han as a kind of, a, you know, like the blues and all of that, um, they don't understand that they just destroy their destroy. own argument. Because the blues is <laughs> because universal. It, it, yeah. it is that, you know, I mean, because, you know, part of Han is like, there's no other culture like this. There's no other, you know, um, mm. like this. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why it becomes completely problematic. I'm going to have to watch Sopion Jay again. And, I, and yeah, I guess with the blues, for example, some of the biggest proponents of that were white guys from England in the 60s and 70s. And it, and it did right. become yeah. universal. Everyone could connect to it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think, Minsu, we should touch on the idea of gender because you said that from that 2017 piece by Sandra Kim, uh, I believe, mm-hmm. um, yes. that was one of the aspects that you felt was missing there. And in, in your recent sure. piece, you did look at that. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I want to look at the idea of Han in terms of maybe the rise of feminism, gender inequality, because yeah. from reading your piece, I got the sense that the the more Han was prevalent in society, the more the women were the ones mm -hmm. that were suffering because of it. So mm -hmm. would you care to perhaps expand on that or talk about the relationship between Han and the role of women in societies, Korean right, absolutely. society? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, some years ago, uh, one of the classic Korean novels that I translated is um, uh, In Hyung Wang Hu Jun, the, uh, the story of Queen In Hyun. Um, mm. And uh, it's loosely, very loosely, based on uh, real events that occurred in uh, the uh, Joseon Dynasty Royal Court in the, um, in, uh, in the late 17th century. Um, and uh, uh, it has, uh, and to me, it, it was fascinating trying to, um, in the introduction that I was writing to the, uh, to the translation, trying to figure out like the configuration of what it meant. So it had a love triangle, you had a king, was married to um, a queen who was the ideal of virtue, mm -hmm. right? Um, and she's just perfect. You know? uh, and she's uh, she never does anything wrong. She's just all good all the time, right? And uh, um, and then he has a concubine, uh, the um, the notorious uh, Chang Hee Bin, um, and uh, who is exactly the opposite of her. Who's um, whose ultimate purpose is dethrone the queen and to, so that she could become a queen herself. So she starts maligning her, you know, and spreads um, uh, slanderous rumors about her, which actually results in the queen actually getting ousted and suffering in exile for many years until all of a sudden the king has an epiphany and said, oh my God, I was, I was, <laughs> I was wrong the whole time and brings her back. And uh, when the queen, after, not long after she's restored, um, she dies under mysterious circumstances. Um, the king figures out that his you know, concubine have used magic to curse her. Uh, this is the novel. Not, not, yeah, not really. yeah, yeah. So, so she's put to death, right? Uh, now, here's the thing. Um, so, um, in all patriarchal societies um, uh, where uh, women have limited or no uh, standing politically, socially, and so on, um, in addition to legal uh, and political methods of oppressing women, um, one of the ways in which they do it is through ideology, right? Um, and uh, and part uh, and part of the ideology is telling them a story over and over again about in which you set up one woman as um, the ideal of virtue, and um, and part of her virtue, in addition to being all good, uh, is her obedience mm. and her silent acceptance of any bad things that happens to her. So she doesn't complain, you know. Um, so she accepts a station in life, does not bring herself forward, and so on. Right? Um, so that's that's sort of the, an impossible ideal that women are made to feel that they need to you know achieve, which I'll never and 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 so make them constantly feel guilty of never being able to achieve that. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have the whole, uh, the horrific, ambitious, um, selfish, narcissistic woman, um, you know, um, who in many cases is a literal prostitute. Right, uh, who is uses her sexual power to get you what you want, and in those stories, invariably, those women had horrible, horrible fates at the end, right? Uh, so mm. they're punished to the end, right? So, so what they do in patriarchal society, on the one hand, you had an impossible ideal on here that they can never, you know, um, you know, um, live up to, and then you get this warning over here about how if you are not constantly trying to be constantly, you know, uh, perfectly virtuous and perfectly, perfectly obedient. You can fall through that and terrible things happen to it. So um, in patriarchal ideology, women are sort of like trapped in between, in between those two images um, and sort of and get to ping pong between them. So that and so and, and so um, women's liberation, uh, one of the first steps is them realizing that this whole construct is nonsense um, and it's built to oppress. Right. And it's built to mm -hmm. say that, you know, don't complain, don't be ambitious. Uh, don't speak your mind, uh, don't pursue your own life, and so on, right? Um, so now this is, again, universal. I mean, you can find this type of narrative anywhere, you know, that where patriarchy exists. Um, so what was interesting is that uh, that whole question, um, and the, I, I mean, you know, and the, there's sort of this, uh, I mean, I can't go into it, but there's a whole interesting history about why that issue becomes so important uh, in Korea, um, 
you know, because they, they uh, because there was there was a kind of crisis in both masculinity and femininity because um, during the Manchu invasions there were so many Korean women who were raped, who were kidnapped, and all that, and there was sort of reconfiguration of you know a woman's place in society. But so, but that idea persists, and then we get to um, you know uh, get to the modern era. Uh, South Korea uh, becomes increasingly wealthy, and with wealth, you have more and more opportunities for women. And so women are getting educated, they're having ambitions, and and now there's this perceived crisis there. Women don't even want to have families, right? mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know, and uh, and, uh, and and oftentimes in um, in sexist rhetoric that makes them selfish, as opposed to you know, I mean, what are the economic conditions that makes them viable for for them in South Korean society to have jobs and family and all that, right? I mean, right. so you know, I so um, anyway, um, so. Um, so there's a perceived notion of um, crisis in the course of the 70s and 80s in which, um, you know, all these women are doing all kinds of things now. And what's going to become of society when they're not producing children, they're not taking care of the home, and they are, you know, taking men's jobs and all of that, right? Um, so, um, so, so instead of just seeing this as sort of a, you know, what, what happens in modern society, and, a, and, I know, and then, you know, from my perspective, it was good things that are happening. Um, there's a reaction against this, right? Uh, so there's this, um, you know, uh, there's this notion that those women, so that 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 old Joseon dynasty notion of like the ideal women and the, you know, and the imperfect, that, that, that still mm. persists, right? Um, mm. I mean, if you if you look at that classic movie, Chayu Buin, uh, Madame Freedom, um, it's it's ludicrous, but it's, I mean, the movie seems to be saying that if you let your wife go outside and get a job, she's going to turn into this completely loose woman who's going to be sleeping with other men and do what she wants, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just absolutely ludicrous, right? Um, so now, uh, what I find interesting is that, especially in the in, in the course of the uh, you know seventies and eighties, um, the the Han discourse is used in that sexist way of keeping of telling uh, you know uh, women that this is uh, this is not a good course for them to go because what they are saying is that um, uh, you know wh whenever they praise uh, you know um, the, the quietly suffering uh, women, um, they are. You know, they are implying that those who are women who are not, who are you know, um, you know, pursuing their ambitions, pursuing justice, and pursuing equal rights and all that. Um, I mean, they're basically saying that they're all kind of whores. I mean, mm -hmm. they're all gonna who are gonna you know have a horrible fates and so on, right? Um, and so um, so they become so this ideology gets developed that women by their nature are the exemplary carriers of harm. Mm. And that's what makes them so, that's what makes Korean women so noble and so beautiful and so admirable because they, they can go through all of this and they still endure and they suffer and they obey and they don't, they, they still know their place and so on, right? Um, mm. And that gets turned into a cudgel with which to attack the advancement of women's rights and opportunities in South Korean society. And, uh, um, and for a lot of Korean women, and for a lot of um, you know uh, Korean women, including feminists, um, that that's unacceptable. I mean that that is. I mean they they see through it. Um, they see through it, and they reject it wholly. Um, and and therefore Han now becomes a completely toxic thing in terms of uh, you know the um, the ongoing and um, only incrementally progressive um, uh, you know journey toward uh, gender equality in South Korea. So you have that, I guess, I, I think it was Freud's Madonna and whore complex in which exactly. women are, are, are right. meant to go through that. Um, right. So, I, I mean, just to, to interrupt, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the Madonna whore, you know, uh, Queen Inhyun, Changi B is a complex, would be called that in Korea. It would be descriptive exactly of that. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's, it's interesting that the, the Han, because Han is talking about suffering and deep rooted suffering. And so it, it might be suggesting to these women, we talked about So uh, in which the woman does suffer. We also talked about Go Eun, who is one of the biggest proponents of Han in his writing mm -hmm. and his poetry and, and the real life situation that has surrounded him and in, yeah. his, in his attitude towards women and his actions towards women. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it seems to be telling, I'm not a Korean woman, so I can't speak for it, but it seems to be suggesting that 
to be a Korean woman, you have to suffer. You have to have this deep rooted suffering. That's the that's what Han is. Han is to suffer mm -hmm. and to bear it. And there's a beauty in that suffering. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's a really <laughs> it's a really oppressive message if you see it like that. And you talked about mm -hmm. Sopyeonje in the early 90s, 1993, as being the last hurrah of Han. And since mm -hmm. then, we've seen the very belated and slow rise of women's movements and feminism. Right. Is this correlation? Is this causation? Uh, how do you see the, the decrease of Han and the rise of um, relatively slowly women's rights in South Korea, Minsu? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, would, I, I would not say that um, uh, the, 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 for me, you know, I, the too slow or progress toward gender equality in South Korea is, um, was the main reason why Han faded it. Um, but I, I think it would be one of the whole array of reasons that I would point to, right? Um, and I think the ma main reason why it has faded is that um, I think, uh, I mean, you know, a lot, lot of Koreans right now, especially young people, they find completely alien those notion that we are a people that is just condemned to this kind of sadness. Right. Um, that, I mean, of course, still, you know, South Korea has lots of problems. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> not calling it, you know, the hell to It's, uh, I mean, it's, um, and it's a very, very stressful society with high rates of suicide and all that. But, uh, but I, I think in, in a certain sense, what is being rejected um, is sort of the, the notion of passivity that comes with Han. Right. Mm. Uh, lots of problems in South Korea, but South Koreans are not passive people at all. I mean, that, that's not, I mean, that word is not something that you would associate. Uh, I mean, it's funny because they were saying that, you know, um, one, of the, one of the first words that like uh, non-Koreans learn, uh, you know, when, when all of a sudden, you know, Korean companies go in is, is pali pali. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, Koreans get made fun of all the times. Like, look at those pali pali people, right? Ori, yeah. ori, right? Um, and, uh, um, and yeah, I mean, despite all those problems, there's, there's, you know, I mean, considering all the great uh, achievements of the last decade, I mean, the notion that, I mean, this is our fate, our fate to be sorrowful and, to, you know, um, and to passively suffer. Um, I think for a lot of young Koreans, that just doesn't seem like, I mean, yeah. I mean, that just seems like an old timey thing to say, like, you know, that, that they do associate with like the 60s and 70s. Um, but um, so I, I think that's the main reason, I, you know, because of the culture shift and the achievement of prosperity and democracy um, in the course of the 90s. Um, that's the main reason. But I think there is an element of that that has to do with expansion of women's rights, right? And it's also connected. It's not completely separate uh, mm. because it's also uh, women not, no longer feeling that they should be seen uh, or act as sort of passive sufferers, right? right. Um, you know, because, I, you know, I, I just, just to return to what I talked about uh, a bit before, um, yeah, just as you said, I mean, the, it contains this notion that to suffer is the sort of natural state of women. Um, and virtue consists of accepting that um, and not trying to, you know, uh, rebel or, you know, uh, complain about that. Um, and I have to say that I, I think I think one of the main motivations that despite sort of, I, I know that the, you know, the, the kind of, difficult conversation that I might be having with Korean Americans and so on is that uh, that one of the main motivations that I decided to take the subject on, at least in this short essay, was um, that um, it had this terrible, terrible effect uh, on mental health, right? Um, that, I mean, if you feel that you're condemned to the kind of sadness that you have, you're not going to seek help. And, and you know, and there's, there's a real problem that I, I've always known that um, there's a terrible problem in South Korea of people just not being really, really reluctant to seek medical help for mental health issues. Right. But um, I, I should not have been surprised, but a couple of years ago, I read an article where it says that even among Korean Americans who are either born in the United States or went over when they're young, that is still the case. It, within the Korean American community, there's still a huge reluctance to seek help for mental health issues, right? Um, and, uh, um, and, and the amount of suffering that people went to um, because they inherited that, um, uh, the notion that, and, and Han plays a, a major role, but uh, I, mean, if, I mean, this is a bit of a, a tangent, but if, mm -hmm. if you indulge me a little bit, right? So I, sure. um, so here's, here's, uh, here's my uh, view that, uh, that um, 
you know, there, there's a uh, uh, historian named Theodore uh, uh, Chun Yu who wrote a marvelous book called It's um, It's Madness. Oh, oh okay. okay, that's his other one. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, yeah his yeah. earlier one. Um, it's called It's Madness. Um, mm. And it's this fascinating study about the introduction of, um, um, uh, what, you know, what used to be abnormal noble psycho uh, psychology practice in South Korea during the colonial era, right? Um, and uh, what's astounding to me as a European historian is uh, what Michel Foucault described in Madness and Civilization as uh, what happened in Europe during the early modern period, when all of a sudden, you know, people are categorized as abnormal mentally and placed in institutions and all of that. Uh, mm. That that all exactly the same thing happened in Korea during the colonial era, where you, you have people who are seen as different, who have certain, you know, disabilities and, and all of that, but who are still members of, of a community, all of a sudden the Japanese come in and they're categorized as abnormal and they're institutionalized, they're you know taken to, away and all of that. Um, and the shock that it caused and also that having an impact on Korean inherent distrust of modern mm. uh, you know, psychological practices, right? Uh, but he, here's the problem. I mean, here, here's, here's the thing. Um, I, th I think what really needs to be combated is this notion that uh, still, I think, exists among a lot of Koreans, uh, and, and as you know, it turned out Korean Americans, is that there are these two dis discrete categories of human beings, the psychologically normal and the psychologically abnormal. And there's this, you know, <laughs> severe dividing line between the two, right? Um, and uh, what you obviously want to do is never cross that line and find yourself in the psychologically abnormal character, uh, uh, you know, uh, category. Um, and uh, uh, and there's all these things that they associate with what leads to you coming, going from one category to the other. And in an extreme level, that could mean, you know, uh, being institutionalized, um, but, you know, even going to therapy, uh, even mm -hmm. seeking pharmaceutical help for things like, you know, depression and all that, right? Um, and therefore, even, you know, um, therefore they'll do anything, everything, uh, you know, including avoidance in order to not see themselves as being in the second category, right? Um, right. Now, what needs to happen in South Korea and, and pretty much all places where this idea is still, I mean, because I, I, I know people in America who still think that, right? Um, that there is no strict dividing. <laughs> Sure. I mean, the, I mean, all of us have problems either temporarily or to a different degree, um, and it's a matter of severity of the kind of symptoms that one may suffer. And also, as I said, I mean, you know, just because something terrible happens to you and you temporarily need to maybe be institutionalized or need pharmaceutical help or need, you know, uh, therapy, that doesn't make you abnormal. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, I mean, it's like, I, you know, that, I mean, so we're all on a kind of spectrum. And, yeah. um, and once we see that, once we see that we are all more or less depressed or more or less, you know, uh, uh, anxious and all of that. And sometimes when it gets spikes at, uh, out at a certain level, um, there should be no stigma to seeking help. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and that, I, I mean, that's, that's where we should get to, but I, I think, I, I still think that in South Korea, um, Still, I mean, for a lot of people, it, at operation, this is no an idea of normal versus that. Mm. Right? You don't want to cross into uh, cross into other, right? Um, and uh, um, and I, I and I, you know, and it was so appalling to read that um, so many Korean Americans inherited that view from their immigrant parents, and um, so they don't seek help, and it turns into this major crisis. Um, and uh, um, and so um, I, I mean, I you know, I heard this terrible, terrible, uh, you know, um, story about that one Korean American kid who, um, who perpetrated a mass school killing in Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, he killed, he killed lots of people. And, uh, and it turned out that his parents knew that there was something, you know, uh, wrong with him for a very long time, but I, they didn't want to cross that line with him. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, the most that they did was they took him to church and had like you know the 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 uh, the, the church members uh, pray over him and you know and all that. But that's not. I mean, the guy was just. I mean, he that guy really needed help, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, as a result, now the thing is though, um, I mean, to me that's that's a problem with Han because I mean Han. I mean, and that's what I, I once again when people tell me their traumas and I I want to tell them that I believe you. But you shouldn't use Han as an explanatory, explanatory, uh, explanatory um, 
concept of which to dis, which uh, which describes what you're going through because Han has no healing in it. Mm. It says you're condemned to this. This is who you are because you're Korean. You know, this is the fate. I mean, it's exactly the thing that sexists are, t- uh, you know, are telling women that this is your natural state, uh, or, you know, to, to suffer and to bear it and, or, and all of that. Right. Um, and uh, um, and I, you know, and as a result, I, um, I don't know, this is an extreme thing to say, but I, I, I think Han killed. I mean, it killed. It brought about mass, uh, you know, a lot of su- needless suffering and all of that. And and I, I think that once you look at it that way, I mean, maybe from a mental health perspective, that this uh, it becomes really, really problematic. Um, and it, it's, I think, um, for a lot of people in, you know, just being Korean and uh, and Korean, uh, Korean Americans, Han may be, you know, may have played a significant role of keeping people from seeking therapy. Mm. And getting prescription for antidepressants, uh, and or, or checking themselves into institution to get some help. This is interesting. How Han becomes not just a cultural concept used to peddle stories in Western media or to convey parts of art or Korean history, but how it plays out in people's real lives and how it might right. cause suffering, how it might kill, how it might oppress women and. Um, what you describe is absolutely true to my experience as well. In South Korea, there are a lot of unfounded mm-hmm. fears about seeking mental health will it affect your insurance or your job prospects because it will be put on a list. I've been on uh, media discussing mental health um, in Korea and listeners would send in messages saying, I suggest not seeking mental health because it will disrupt people around you. And people are actually going out of their way to send in messages saying, just suffer in silence. And I found that heartbreaking, but also real at the same time, that that was a, (laughs) that that was a common kind of message that was, that was being played out in that sense. Um, With well, I mean, if I may put one, one little thing in. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I was having a uh, conversation recently with a, a friend of mine who's a novelist. And, uh, and he, I mean, he mentioned something about taking antidepressives um, and so on. And, um, and he told me at some point that I don't know any fellow novelist who's not taking some kind of medication. <laughs> And, uh, and that's fine. I mean, it's just like, I mean, and he told me what the experience was like that and so on. But uh, yeah, I can see it. I mean, I... Um, I can see even today, unfortunately, I think in South Korean society, if somebody was were taking antidepressant medicine, mm. I mean, if that got out, you know, I mean, people's perception of them would completely change, and a lot of it would have to do would deal with reputation, yeah, about being perceived as having you know crossed that line into the abnormal category, um, and therefore, even even for those people who are taking it, it's it's like this deep dark secret that has to be kept as opposed to. This is one of the things that are available in modern society to give you a little help. It's mm. everyone's fault. Right? Yeah. I cross that line multiple times a day, I think, as I, <laughs> as I try to survive through this thing called existence. Um, one of the things that I was going to bring up here is there, there are two things I want to touch on. One is perhaps how, you know, the idea of comfort women might play into this. I'm not sure how mm-hmm. sensitive that is, but with this idea of suffering and existence and, and gender, which we've touched on, that before that, though, this idea of intergenerational trauma so many of my students these days are talking about this concept and all of a sudden i've had to go and do some reading on it because it wasn't a thing people were talking about to me 10 years ago in the university classroom now they're all sort of mentioning it so i've had to get to terms with it and one of my students i'm working with on a project uh, for the royal asiatic society she's doing the woman's experience over time and she's put it out in three parts her grandmother her mother and her and the Mm -hmm. traumatic experiences uh, that her grandmother went through um, and then her mother and and these would have been traumatic in South Korea during Mm -hmm. the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And then it got to her and she'd drawn sort of images of these three people and her one had a sad face. And so I was kind of asking her, like, compared to South Korea is no heaven, but compared to the experiences of your grandmother and your mother, Mm -hmm you have relative freedom and safety you're you're at a good university you have food in the fridge so why why are you sad and she she described it as this 
intergenerational trauma being passed down. And I wondered, and I honestly questioned her whether she was doing that as part of her identity, to feel closer to her mother, that she was seeking that sadness to define herself. But when she had to look at the sadness actually in the reality around her, she couldn't necessarily point to colonization mm -hmm. or re intent patriarchy, that it was a much freer society. So do you have a, any observation on this this concept of generational trauma being passed down and maybe as a way of uh, connecting yourself to your, your your mother your father and such forth yeah absolutely i mean i um so um once again you know i mean in my defense i absolutely believe in inter uh intergenerational trauma i absolutely mm -hmm. believe it right um and um and i i used to just believe it as uh as kind of something that's passed down from you know, uh, practice of being raised by people who've been traumatized and all that. But I, I too have read some stuff about some biological basis. There's some biological basis to, um, you know, uh, trauma that's passed down. And uh, it, it seems to be completely convincing. So I, you know, so the notion that, yeah, we did both through, you know, uh, social and um, biological basis um, inherited some of the ter more, more terrible things that, you know, um, our, our previous generation had gone through. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, all of that makes perfect sense to me. But um, but that's I, I I mean that's not the whole story because um, it's not that big a mystery to me why South Korea is one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, I mean it goes all the way back to like kids in school about like you know the sheer amount of competition that they have to go through mm -hmm. um you know i uh um I, you know i i remember talking to um a, a korean writer who um who said that like i mean he, he grew up on the you know a sort of dire dire poverty during the uh, uh during the 60s and 70s but um but he said that he had this dream that he, you know, one day he would like to go abroad and study literature at a, uh, at a foreign, uh, at a European university, and uh, and come back to uh, be a writer. And at that time, with Korea still, you know, I still a third world country, and that that was like mm -hmm. a pipe dream. But he managed to achieve all of it. He managed to achieve all of, all of that. He managed to go abroad, and you know, and and became a novelist and so on. And and he told me this like really sad story about like his son who's went to all the right schools um, and uh, was doing really, really well. And he said, what is, he, one day he sat his son down and said, what is your dream? What is, what is like the really big thing that you want to achieve? Like, you know, when I was your age, I wanted to study at a European university and become a novelist, right? Mm. And uh, his, his answer was, I would like to own my own apartment. I think I would breathe a huge sigh of relief if yeah. I actually had my own apartment. Right? And, and the Not a building, like an apartment, you mean. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right? And he's like, that's it? That's your dream, right? Um, and, you know, the thing is, I, um, yeah, I mean, the intergenerational, I mean, it's like, um, I mean, I think to me, the high rates of suicide is like a, a unfortunate conjunction and the perfect storm of that kind of, intergenerational uh, trauma that comes from the tumultual history of South Korea. And us in our relenting drive toward prosperity, having created this unbelievably competitive society where um, you never inherently feel, you know, uh, you're good enough and you constantly have to compete and compete and compete. And and the way, way the school system is configured um, and, uh, um, and the uh, and and there's so much shame that it's involved in not living uh you know living up to the uh, uh, impossible ideals um and uh, what i think is that i mean because i i think you know i mean because of uh the uh, impoverished circumstances under which south korea was uh, had to pull itself out um there's been such a unrelenting and you know just re relentless drive toward prosperity that um mm -hmm. I think the priority needs to be shifted. I think South Korea should now really be looking at the happiness index. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. So yeah. instead of, I mean, you know, I mean, our GMP is doing fine. <laughs> GMP is doing fine, right? But let's look at like, you know, how South Koreans answer when they ask the question and and, and try to achieve and, 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 and see 
what the Scandinavian countries are doing so that they have the highest, you know, happiness level in the world and where, you know, where South Korea, South Korea is not measuring up. Um, and until that happens, I, you know, I mean, people are still going to constantly, you know, uh, kill themselves. And, you know, um, and uh, again, I, I know why all these women are refusing to have, you know, families and kids. It's, it's, I mean, it's not because they are selfish. It's not because they only think about themselves because it's, I mean, the very condition is making it impossible for them to, you know, for, for, for many of them, for that to be a viable option in their life, to be mm. both seeking their, uh, you know, ambitions as well as that, right? So, so yeah, uh, international, uh, intergenerational uh, trauma that's there. But, you know, that in conjunction with the uh, kind of, the, the kind of society uh, that we have become, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it has to be considered in, in both terms. Is it, if, Han is not the defining Korean characteristic, Minsu, um, and, and maybe it's had its heyday in in the cultural manifestations. I guess I have two questions here. The first one you've already touched on the idea of Bali Um <laughs> Is there a defining characteristic of what it means to be Korean, or would that again be a form of essentialism or, uh, or Orientalism, whatever words we? Is there a defining characteristic of? Uh, what it is to be korean and the second one is it possible to change that and if so how long would it take because you know han whether it was real or not i i think it did play a role in the 20th century 20th century mm -hmm. in Korea. Before this conversation, I asked my wife about Han just, you know, over coffee, mm -hmm. and she said, Yeah, Han is real, and things like this. So it still yeah. plays some role in some people's right. mind. Um, yeah. Is there a substitute for Han? And is it actually possible to uh, to replace that over time? How long might it take? Or is it too deep rooted, I guess? Mm -hmm. Can, can yeah. it change, Minsu? Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, Again, um, as a historian, and uh, um, so, and as somebody who had the, um, I, so, um, so my father was a diplomat for the South Korean government, so I grew up in half a dozen countries, um, mm. you know, uh, and so um, I had the opportunity to um, observe cultures close up in many different parts of the world, and, um, and, you know, this idea of, like, finding that one concept that makes us unique and makes us different from everybody else that itself is a universal desire okay right i see yeah. it all over the place right mm -hmm. and uh, um and both from my life experiences and also as a as a historian no i am i'm always i mean i my defenses go completely up whenever you know people talk about ethnic essentialism mm. uh notions that are unique and all that i mean in the sense that like um yes every people every group of uh, ethnic group is unique right in the sense that every individual is unique right nobody's exactly the same but mm. is there anything that one could point to that makes them essentially unique um well in almost every case when i do investigation into all of that uh i uh it, it turns into a historical con uh, construct that is uh that is phantom right um you know i um uh, Actually, in my own, you know, long years of living, having lived in this country, um, I don't find Americans any more individualistic than a lot of people that I found. Mm -hmm. um, what is different about Americans is that they talk about individualism a lot. <laughs> right. Without necessarily practicing it in any more significant way than lots of people I've seen it. I mean, that, I mean in other words, it's a self-image. Mm. Right, so that when I see Americans doing exactly the same thing as everybody else around them, uh, dressing the same way, having the same political ideas, you know, and, and speaking the same manner, and just repeating political talking points that they heard on their favorite TV station, all that, uh, they all think they're doing it out of individualistic reasons, right? Um, because that's what Americans have been told. I mean, this is what makes us different from anybody else. Is Americans are more, you know, rugged individuals than anybody else, and when. I mean, and they never really question if that's actually true, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, um, but it's uh, so. Um, so yeah, I I, I think it's uh, so. I'm I'm naturally very skeptical to those ideas. Um, and in fact, you know, there's a this is kind of a funny thing. I uh, so they uh, you know one of the things I point out is that uh, one of the problems with you know a Koreans thinking that Han is quintessentially Korean is that the word is not of originally Korean origin. It's from Chinese. Um, it's there's mm -hmm. a Chinese character of Han in it. That doesn't mean that it's not a Korean character. 
right? I mean, it, it's not it's not a Korean word. Um, I mean, because like uh, you know, significant numbers of English words are from Norman French. Uh, wow. You know, after Norman uh, invasion, um, that doesn't mean that those you know words like construction or souvenir are not English words. They're definitely English words, right? It's just that they come from uh, somewhere else. Um, so, um, so at one point in an earlier version of my essay, I said that well, they, you know, there is a Korean word, umari, which is a native word, mm. right? Umari, um, and uh, uh, and what it uh, what it denotes is that a feeling of a lump in your chest, mm. and uh, it, it 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 can mean something medical, as in like a, a like a fatty tissue that gets developed, um, and uh, but also it it, it umari can mean uh, exactly the same same thing as Han, a, a accumulation of all these negative feelings and all of that, right? That that you know sorrow, hatred, and all that that just gets in. So this feeling of like you know, stuffiness in your chest just from all these bad feelings that you have about something, right? Uh, mm. And that's not a Chinese, what of Chinese origin, that's a definite. Uh, so uh, in an early version of the essay, well, it's like, you know, look, I, you know, Han is problematic, but if you still want to have this notion of this kind of, you know, unique Korean sense uh, of uh, um, of resentment and sorrow and all that, why not use Ungari, right? Um, and the thing is, you know, all the, uh, all of my, uh, all the, uh, uh, professors of uh, Korean literature and culture in Korea that I showed the essay, early version of the essay uh, to, um, mm. you know, before I submit, they, they all said, no, stop that, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, because, you know, not, not because they hated the term, uh, but it's like, I mean, you just, you're just introducing another word to replace something that, that you just showed is like a, it's a completely, uh, uh, you know, fabricated notion, right? Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, but the thing is, though, as I said, I, um, Look, I, I, I think, I'll, you know, what's funny is that uh, there's been a couple of times I asked young Koreans, uh, do you ever use Han now, right? Um, and uh, um, and they, they said, I mean, what, what, this funny, hilarious guy is that, you know, sometimes I use it when uh, a foreigner asks me some really silly general questions about Korean, uh, about mm -hmm. being Korean, and just to just get rid of him, I say Han. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, you know, and, but do you think it's real? I said, nah, I don't know. Right. Uh, well, yeah, uh, but the thing is, I, I think what makes words go out of style and it becomes me uh, meaningless is, um, I mean, it, it didn't, I mean, you know, the word didn't go out of style in South Korea and became a, a culturally insignificant because a bunch of academics and scholars said that this is a highly problematic idea and all that. Um, that I mean, it, it, that's not why it went away. It just became irrelevant. Because mm -hmm. it, um, the, the very, uh, you know, the concept of Koreans being condemned to this passive suffering, um, it just just did not seem to reflect what people's, uh, you know, idea of, them, of themselves are. So, um, so yeah, uh, I mean, it already has changed, um, you know, um, and it's, I think it will continue to change. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and my, you know, my essay is just one little contribution to seeing if I could contribute to that change because I, I do find the idea of problematic. Well, look, look, I, I you know, I mean, I, I do have to say one thing. Um, mm. uh, one of the objections that I got, which is interesting, is that um, uh, there's, there's a view that, the, you know, Korean Americans may be coming out with their own unique notion of Han. Mm -hmm. uh, that's totally different from what it was. And uh, um, that, you know, um, and and that that it, you know that this is a, this is yet a new stage of evolution of the word um that you know that that has much more to do with the korean american experience um of negative emotions than than korean one um and but in order to do that they have to i mean the the, the problem is you know of, of course their idea of this is uh of the new idea that they would want to use for their own purpose would be one devoid of all this sexist, you know, nationalist, racist, you know, origins, right? Mm. Um, but a lot of them are not even aware of it, or not, not even aware of the his, uh, history, but they, but, you know, but, you know, when I get confronted and say, well, what, what's wrong with somebody, you know, reconfiguring, uh, uh, you know, a word, right? Um, well, my response is, I, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it, except that, um, you do have to question whether that's an advisable thing to do for certain words that has a toxic history. Mm. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, I, and th that's why I brought up the term hysteria in my essay about how that once used to be seen as a legitimate uh, medical psychological word, but it is no longer that. And 
Also, it's become terribly toxic because of the uses that word hysteria has been used to oppress women, especially during the 19th and early 20th century. Um, so why would you even want to do that? You know, um, and uh, um, and like, uh, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I, I, have an, I have another extreme example. Like, like for instance, um, you know, the the word Aryan. You know, um, I mean, originally it was it was a, a neutral term for a supra ethnic uh, category of people who were originated in the Caucasus. Um, hmm. But then the term got completely hijacked by uh, racists um, in the late nineteenth and uh, twentieth, and then you know the Nazis used it over and over and over, so that. Um, I mean, it became such a toxic word that, like, you know, after after the Nazis, you know, uh, got done using it, that uh, scholars, you know, now don't use that word anymore. They right. just use it in the European, right? I mean, they're completely neutral, you know, in the European. Um, now, the thing is, though, I mean, you know, the, if one were to say that, well, so the word Aryan, they, you know, went through a couple of different phases of, you know, uh, alteration of the meaning. Um, what would be wrong with me just taking it up and just saying that this is not, you know, I mean, you know, it's like, but I'm like, why would you want to do that? Why? Mm. You know, it has too much history. You know? It has too much history. Um, and the thing is, I, I feel that way with art, right? It has too much history. It's just, and if you're aware of the entire history of it, then it, I mean, it's like, then the question, why would you, would you want to do this in the first place, right? Yeah. It's just like the swastika as well, I guess, which is still right, still a Buddhist symbol. You will still see it in temples over here uh, in, in some places as well. But nobody's really using that. Nobody's saying pointing to the original history in European culture or North American culture. It, right. it, it's, it's been consigned, I think. Uh, not too many young children called Adolf either being born. These yeah, days. yeah, it, right. It, exactly. exactly. You so know, I, I actually wrote an essay uh, uh, about uh, where I mentioned the swastika about, and uh, well, I mean, I, I, I wrote a short, uh, very short essay about how, um, you know, when we look at tyrannies, uh, we look at its greatest crimes, but sometimes even if you look at small crimes that they committed, they also give interesting insights into the nature of tyranny, right? Um, mm. And I, I think, of course, the worst thing that the Nazis did was the Holocaust and plunging the world into war, but one of the least of the crimes is forever tainting that venerable and ancient, uh, you know, uh, form uh, of the swastika from Hindu Buddhist religions, and make, you know, forever making it into a, a into a symbol of evil. And and interesting enough, uh, <laughs> I gave that example uh, because I was talking about uh, President, uh, the recently uh, deceased uh, ex President Chan Du Han, um, mm. about uh, how obviously the worst thing that he ever did was you know uh, destroying. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, destroying the promise of. Uh, Democracy after the assassination of Park Chung hee and then the massacre of uh, of Gwangju, followed by an incredibly oppressive people, uh, oppressive uh, region. But um, yeah. you know, this is really interesting minor crime that it committed. That uh, that I think is uh, I think um, uh, I don't know if you know the story, but there, there's there's an actor named Park Yong Shik, um, mm -hmm. and he was a comedian and. Uh, um, and he uh, and he used to play buffoon roles, right? Because he, you know, uh, and he used to do this comic figure. Um, and uh, you know, after Park Chung, uh, after Chun Duan came to power, uh, these men in scary men in suits showed up at his house and ordered him to get out of show business because he looked too much like the president. I mean, he looked identical to him, mm, right? And so mm. that at a time when he is trying to solidify his power. You could not have a guy who looks exactly not, uh, like him running around doing this buffoon roles, right? Uh, so, so, so during his whole entire regime, he had to, he, he, uh, he, he, he could not act. I mean, he, he was not allowed to it. But, um, but here's an interesting, so, so, you know, I mean, that, that gives insight about how mm. inherently insecure tyrannies are. Yeah. Right? I mean, they, they can't even allow that, you know, even, even that has to be suppressed. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting is that after, uh, Chun Duan fell from power. Um, the uh, the network, I think it was NBC. They they did a historical drama about the tyrants of the past, and when they had to cast Chun Duan, <laughs> guess who they cast? Park Yong Shik. <laughs> yeah, they. <laughs> He already had the hairstyle already, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the thing is, that you see him in uniform. Oh my God, he looks exactly like him, and it's like a. What a revenge. I'm yeah. well, I mean, the perfect revenge. <laughs>
That's fantastic. I'm going to go and have a look at that. Um, while you're here, Minsu, and, and you're just speaking about Chandawan and, uh, and Korean history and things like that, because you are a historian by trade, I, I want to see if I can give you a couple of questions on Korean history. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, you, um, now... I've felt that in different societies or cultures, there are different conversations that one shouldn't necessarily transgress, certain conversations that are very sensitive. And sometimes that conversation might be about race. Sometimes that conversation mm -hmm. might be about religion, that there are just things, you know, in polite society you don't do. In South Korea, I felt that conversation is about history, right. that, you know, there's, there's a narrative of Korean mm -hmm. history and, you know, sometimes Tomorrow I have to talk about cherry blossoms uh, on the media. And I thought that would be a nice, easy topic. I start looking into the history of cherry blossoms and even yeah. that I'm realizing, <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to be expelled from the country if I want to do the real history. And right. so um, you, you've mentioned historical myths and things like that. Is, is history, I'm, I'm not sure the question I'm trying to ask, history and a focus on truth and avoiding this post-truth society which you expressed fears about mm -hmm. with um presidential elections and vaccines and then this kind of narrative that gets easily disseminated amongst people which i think mm -hmm. is like can how do you think historical myths and narratives work in korea vis-a-vis -vis history right um yeah that's uh, that's uh, that's a great question uh, because this th that's something i think about all the time um well, I, I'll start with a sort of a general thing that I found. Um, I think um, the real progress in uh, freedom of expression and, I mean, frankly, the maturity, of, uh, the measure of a maturity of a democratic society mm. lies in how free the people feel in criticizing themselves. Mm -hmm. right? uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a way, I, uh, I'm at... I'm at my uh, I'm I'm proudest to be Korean when I see real signs of self-criticism and self-awareness. A um, uh, bunch of years ago, uh, I saw this rather wonderful TV show where, uh, because you know, a, as you know, this um, you know South Korea because of its wealth, uh, it's having it's been having a bit of a uh, undocumented alien problem, and mm -hmm. also. Uh, it's well known that people in rural areas, men cannot find women to marry, so they bring a lot of brides and, and so on. And um, and the thing is, I mean, given the low birth rate of South Korea, um, I mean, it's either become multicultural or die. I mean, that that's going to be the stock stock, um, you know, choice that the country is going to have to make. You know, I mean, because it's not. I mean, and uh, and there's lots of people who do want to get in. I mean, it's lots, of, especially you know, um, mm -hmm. ethnic Koreans from China who are were dying to get in um and so um but the thing is i mean given the numbers of horrific incidents that occurred with undocumented aliens uh, laborers um you know there, there's one great documentary they asked the question are we racists and it was really really searing i mean it was mm. and i um and I, you know the thing is i mean there, there, there's sort of a primitive form of nationalism that says you know in, in korea or elsewhere in america everywhere this says my country right or wrong yeah, you know, uh, I mean, and, and to me, I have nothing but contempt for that kind of low level kind of nationalism. Um, I mean, the, as I said, I mean, the, I mean, to me, when a country asks so, such critical questions of itself, uh, including its historical questions, um, that's when I, you know, that's progress. That's uh, being uh, being honest and so on. Um, yeah. Um, look, I uh, in terms of history, I mean, there's a couple of other things I tell my students in my historical myth class um, uh, that. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, th this idea of historical discourse occurs at three related, but sometimes, you know, um, you know, conflicting arenas. One, history as uh, as perceived among regular people, uh, that mm. much of it coming from education and from re readings. Um, and uh, second, history as disseminated as state policy, right? What what the government says about this is how you should view about history. Mm. And then history as practiced by academic historians. And uh, and sometimes there's a great deal of disconnect among the three, right? Um, like, 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 for instance, I mean, I, one of the uh, big problems in America is that unlike, uh, I mean, one, one really great thing about Britain is that it has lots of great uh, 
um, uh, popular historians, um, people who are really you know yeah. up to date with the latest research, but write primarily for the larger audience. Um, but in America, they aren't. Um, you know, so much of uh, you know historical uh, writings that are popular gets written by journalists um, and amateurs. Um, and uh, um, and and frankly, academic historians in America don't really. I mean, because that, that that's not that's seen as sort of a lower form of. Uh, and that, but you know, I, I I I've been advocating years that it should be kind of a self-imposed requirement that every academic historian in America should write at least one popular history book, mm-hmm. right? Rather than leaving leaving it to the amateurs and letting them spread all these myths, right? Um, but see, uh, but the thing is that there's a difference. I mean, they, I I think um, I, you know, I think. Uh, I mean, South Korea has made a lot of progress, but there are still areas of deep, deep sensitivity that nobody wants to uh, go into, other than academic historians in fairly obscure academic journals. I mean, they can, you know, uh, disguise them in very, uh, you know, uh, scholarly language. Um, but, um, but I, I think, um, you know, but I think even in the popular perception of it, I mean, you know, one of the things I tell my students all the time is that, is that. Um, well, when people say such, you know, proclaim such cliches as history is just stories written by the winners, um, a lot of them don't know the difference between true history and propaganda. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there, there was a journalist who once wrote about how we need to we need to do more forgetting of history, right? Because you know, uh, because you know, history has, uh, you know, the obsession with history has caused all this kind of ethnic, uh, and, and but. If you look at every example that he says, he's, to- he's talking about ludicrous historical myths, right? That has fueled anger and hatred and all of that, right? Um, and uh, um, but so so um, so th- so that's important. But I, but the thing is, yeah, I mean, I, I but I, I think South Korea, um, you know, especially since the establishment of democracy in '87, uh, has made a great deal of progress. But um, but I do recognize absolutely what you say is that there, there are things that you cannot say that. If you say it, it could get you into massive, massive problems, uh, you know, trouble in the in the popular realm. But um, but I, I but I would like to, uh, you know, I, I would like to um, sort of advocate that. Um, again, self-criticism and showing to the world that his, you know, uh, that historical scholarship or historical narrative in this country is not only very self-critical, but it adheres to a high, high standard of objectivity is one of the best way you can show off how uh, mature your democracy has uh, become. Mm. Uh, and you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I want to make one <laughs> thing. I, uh, so, as opposed to sort of more primitive form of nationalism that says, you know, the way to show off is to just portray history as we great at everything, right? We're mm. all, always either terrible, terrible victims of horrible evil, or we just kicked ass at everything, right? Um, now, uh, yeah. I just want to point out one thing, right? Um, um, my favorite Korean historical movie of all time. This is my absolute favorite. What is um, it? It's, uh, I'll give the English title. It's, it's The Fortress, uh, Naman Sansong. Mm. Uh, it, it, it was made about five years ago, uh, 2017. Um, and uh, um, and it's, it's about what happened during the Manchu invasion when King Injo made the dumbest move possible in opposing the Manchus when the Ming Dynasty was falling apart, which resulted in this massive Manchu invasions of Korea. Um, and the story revolves around how the royal court had to ret- leave the capital and retreated to the castle at uh, Naman, uh, uh, to the fortress castle at Naman uh, Mountain. And it's about two advisors uh, who are giving contradictory advice to the king. And they are surrounded by the Manchu war machine that just mm. conquered China. <laughs> One guy saying that, you know, we need to stick to our honor and defend the Ming and fight to our death. Uh, and the other saying, what's the point? <laughs> you know, we need to surrender now. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a great movie because they're both portrayed as good, loyal men who, you know, who really think that they're, you know, their advice is right. Um, but, um, but what was fantastic about this movie was that there was nothing heroic about any of this. I mean, it was just a searingly honest portrayal about how utterly incompetent the leadership of the kingdom was, um, how badly the chosen, chosen military was run, and how, how quixotically idiotic their military strategies that they were employing. And how, I mean, it was a story about men who just could not see reality for what it was, right? And, uh, um, 
And uh, um, and so uh, and ironically, the the most humiliating thing that they ended up doing, which was the surrender, the king King Indra surrendering on his you know hands and knees and all that, um, that ushered in one of the most more, more, more stable and prosperous era of chosen dynasty, uh, uh, you know, on, under the uh, under the peace of uh, the, the the Qing dynasty. Anyway, um, and that that movie was just so good. I mean, it was just I mean, it was just so real and so objective, and it was so well made mm-hmm. and all that. Um, and unfortunately, I um I uh just recently I saw what became one of my least favorite historical films that I've seen that I I just I just thought was uh terrible. Um. Uh, it, the English title is the, uh, is the battle, the road, the road to victory. Um, in the Pong Pong Tong Chan Tu, um, it was it was made about a couple of years ago, um, and it was about this supposed battle that took place in Manchuria between the Japanese army and Korean resistance fighters, um, and uh, um, and it, I mean, it was just, I mean, it, I mean, it was like a throwback to. The kind of propaganda war movies where um I mean the basically the Japanese are orcs from the uh, from the Lord of the Rings movies. Crooked right? teeth and, uh, and that yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, yeah. I mean you know, uh, I mean just doing like an encyclopedic enactment of every atrocity that was ever committed during the colony, right? And you got this unbelievably sturdy, moral, like patriotic Koreans, uh, you know, uh putting up and um, and he portrays this massive battle where this resistance fighter just massacres this massive Japanese army, and then when the movie's over and it tells you like the source of what really happened, <laughs> it was a ridiculous little skirmish, right? Wow. That they just blow up. And the thing is, I mean, you know, what, what was frustrating is that um, I know I haven't seen them, but I know that the Chinese have been making a series of propaganda movies that takes place during the Korean War, right? Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't been able to see it, but ev- everything I read about it makes them sound completely ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, and, and but the thing with, with China is that they have such a huge population that even if they make a huge budget movie, they don't need it the success elsewhere outside of Korea. I mean, enough people are going to see it, it sees it in Korea, um, and these are blockbuster successes. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, so uh, I mean, I think the Chi- uh, Chinese may be under the mistaken notion that if they make these movies where it's all pro-China, the whole history is skewed toward uh, toward that, um, it actually does not make them look good. It makes them look ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I mean, you know, I it, it, it may, I mean, you know, distorting history like that, and and uh, and even if you didn't know anything about Korean history, you, I mean, I, I you know, I from the description you watch the movie, and it's just it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, all good Chinese people versus orcs. Americans are orcs, right? Uh, mm. um, and the thing is that I, I you know, I, my, my, you know, I feel that if you um, if you if you look at those two Korean movies that I mentioned, um, I think a movie like The Battle Road to Victory does not make look Korea good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a ridiculous film. It's a, it's a ridiculous ideal film. Um, but I guarantee you, I think for uh, for non-Koreans, when they watch The Fortress, I think they will be extraordinarily impressed by how honest Koreans are able to be with their history and their failures. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, um, and you know, and that that is so much, I mean, I, and I hate to use the word, that, that much, so, so much better propaganda than making this ridiculous propaganda of, of idealized versions of, you know, of, of the history. And, um, and I, I, so I, you know, I, uh, I, so that's my view. I mean, I think, you know, um, I think, um, I'm, but I, I'm afraid I, you know, a lot of Korean nationalists are, you know, nationalistic in that kind of primitive uh, way of, you know, my country right or wrong. Mm. Um, which, uh, I, I mean, the thing is, but, but the thing is, I, I, I watch a lot of American movies that are like that. And, yeah. you know, and I, I laugh at them too. Um, you know, I, w- one of the movies that I assigned for my historical myth class is that Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai. I haven't seen it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that movie ends with Tom Cruise lecturing the Chinese, uh, lecturing the Japanese emperor of what it is to be a true Japanese. <laughs> and I just don't know why nobody just stands up and says, hey, white boy needs to shut up. I'm sure many people did. I'm yeah. sure there were many people that did say that. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. There are movies like that all over the world. Perhaps you might need to add a, a thing to your tripart: history among regular people, history of state mm-hmm. policy, history as academics, 
and history as movies because that, that's right, a right. huge thing these days like history yeah. carried out as uh, as propaganda I, i'm going to check out the fortress and and, and the in contrast to the battle raw to victory mm -hmm. i wonder and you said the fortress was more accurate realer in its depiction showing the uh this is difficult question but a silly question minzu is it because it was relative to the manchurian war machine and not the japanese that 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 history is it we can show this one because yeah. actually manchuria doesn't exist anymore you know you look for it on a map and it's got is it because well we can do that one but we couldn't yeah. do it here. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, um, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, um, I, you know, I, I because I, I'm, I'm now trying to think of uh, examples of war about uh, movies about Korean resistance to the Japanese Empire that had some. I mean, I can think of examples where, uh, you know, there, there were. Um, well, it, the the it's seen as much more complicated than this, right? I mean, like 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 for instance, um, many years ago, um, his, the historian Michael Robinson, who's who's an expert on colonial Korea, um, he made a he made a really really, I mean, you know, I mean, now it seems obvious, but he made a really good point about um, uh, sort of the problem with the depiction of um, uh, of Koreans under Japanese imperial rule, which is that um, again, it's the, the problem of binary. Right. Mm, yeah. Either you are put into the category of collaborator or resistor. Mm. Right? Uh, like 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 all Koreans belong in one category of, uh, or, or the other. Right. Whereas in reality, he showed that like lots of people had to collaborate to some degree. Right. But at the same time, you know, even people who, are, who would be like, uh, you know, categorized as category, they, they found, you know, instances where they could you know, uh, to, to resist here and there, right? Mm. Um, and uh, um, and there were lots of, you know, uh, resistors who also had to do things to work within the system. Um, and uh, and so, um, and that brings about a much more complicated picture, right? What Koreans had to do on an everyday basis, right? Um, that could be seen as collaboration, even though, you know, deep in their hearts, they, you know, they, they want independence and so on, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at movies uh, about the colonial era, um, I mean, I, I think there's that stock binary, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. uh, um, and I, I, I can't think of a movie that really pointed to a much more um, nuanced and complicated notion of what it is to be a resistor versus a collaborator. Movies don't work on that dynamic. Movies work on that, you know, right. good versus evil. That's why I like I like seeing memes online these days, and it's sort of saying to a to America, "Go on, please go and save the world, just like you do in the movies. Go and kill the right. guy. go and save <laughs> Ukraine, please." You know, because yeah. that's what we see happen in the movies. But real yeah. life is grey. Real life is squiggly lines and uh, and lots of difficulty. Um, that's actually why I like Theodore Janu's book on Koreas, because it, it doesn't paint those binaries and it looks at mm -hmm. the complexities. Let me just ask you, if I can, Minsu, about this idea of intellectual history, because this is mm -hmm. your title. That sounds amazing, though. It's not like economic history or military yeah. history, but it's like intellectual history, smart right. history. Um, right. Could you perhaps just explain to me what that is and if possible, put it into a Korean context or, or you know, mm -hmm. what intellectual history is as a field, as a, as a genre, and then mm -hmm. any observations on intellectual history in Korea and how that might have developed or whether it's sure, applicable. Sure. Um, well, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, yeah, I will attempt to do that. Although uh, all of my work in intellectual history has been in Europe, right? But um, I mean, sort of the, uh, my basic uh, description of intellectual history to my uh, graduate students is that intellectual history is, a way, um, is an approach to history where in any given period, uh, it's one of two things. In any given period, we look at who the intellectuals were in the society, and look at three aspects. One, their lives. So we, we read a lot of biographies. Um, mm. And also how the uh, times that they lived in, um, uh, um, you know, um, contributed to the kind of ideas that they ended up writing about. So, you know, mm. philosophers, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, philosophers, writers, poets, and scientists, and all those people, right? So, um, you know, so, so what, what was it about, like, say, for instance, the second half of the 17th century, there was a ripe for all of these scientific revolutionary uh, ideas to be created. Um, and then the third aspect of it is um, how those ideas ended up impacting everything forward, right? So, 
Uh, so, for instance, um, you know, if I'm doing, uh, uh, as a, if I'm looking at Karl Marx uh, as an intellectual historian, so I'll look at his biography, and I'll look at, you know, what was happening in Europe at the time, the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. and its massive change that was occurring that, you know, that made Karl Marx think about what he, you know, uh, think about what is happening and coming out with uh, his ideas. And then third part would be how his communist ideas impacted history throughout that, right? Um, another approach to intellectual history is where, I, uh, where what I did with my book on the history of automata, uh, which is um, get a single idea and see how that idea changed over time. So in my book, what I dealt with was um, the idea that human beings are essentially a machine, that the best way to understand the human being is as a machine and a history of that idea, where that idea comes from, how it mm -hmm. changed over the course of history and how it impacted you know, uh, you know, people thought at the time, but I also write about people who resisted that idea. Who are the people in the society who said, no, human beings are not like machines. There's mm. something else about human beings that makes them now mechanical and are actually uh, protesting against that idea. Um, so I, I actually started all the way in ancient Greece and then that I take it up to the 20th century um, with, with heavy emphasis um, when I mean, the, at the time period when the idea of the human being as machines was at its biggest was uh, was um, in the course of the second half of the 17th and into the uh, 18th century, um, when everything was being described as machines and all that. And then in the era following, during the Romantic era, there was a massive backlash against it. Mm, right. Right? We're not machines. We're not machines. We're, you know, uh, our soul is filled with uh, uh, vitality and uh and um, and I show that how that discussion still goes on today. Um, you know, although it's because of the advancement of medicine, it's more uh, the uh, I, the debate is more about if our minds could be described as a uh, as mechanical or not, or is it is it a completely non mechanical entity? Um, well, um, you know, so I, I haven't done much of that with uh, Korea, but uh, I think uh, good examples of uh, kind of intellectual history that could be done with Korea is like. Um, you know, I, one, one of the things that, um, you know, when I talk to historians from China is that, you know, they said, uh, you know, they I, I hear this over and over. They're like, haha, Koreans, more confusions than Chinese. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, so, you, um, so one of the things that you might look at is why, um, you know, why this really very, very orthodox form of neo-confusionism was developed um, in the early Joseon dynasty era. And um, and one of the things I would point out is how the change of regime needed uh, necessitated adoption of a completely new ideology. Yeah. Right. So uh, so just as you know, so so just as the kings wanted to say that one of the reasons Korea Dynasty fell is that you know there there, there were a bunch of decadent Buddhists. Um, so now we're gonna you know really I mean not not just be Confucians but really 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 be Confucians right yeah. uh, to the extent of suppressing Buddhism and all of that. Um, and so, um, so that that's the kind of historical context with which you look at the great confusion philosophers of Joseon Dynasty and so on. It reminds me there was a piece by uh, ex President Kim Dae Jung. I can't remember if it was Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy, where he looked at the history of democracy as an idea in mm -hmm. Korean thought over time. Mm -hmm. um, right. You mentioned this idea as people as autonomous or as robots things like this rather than living right. beings uh, just on that question i'll ask you as a ridiculous thing minsu while you're here do we do we have free will <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know i i uh, because i'm not a philosopher um i'll give you my favorite answer uh, okay. uh my, my favorite answer from a philosopher which is uh, uh the answer given by nietzsche which is uh where he said that uh the very question is um faulty because it, impl it implies that all human beings are the same um what nietzsche would say that um all of us are more or less capable of free will mm. uh they're, they're, you know i mean and, and from his his view vast majority of human beings are not capable of free will at all but they're, 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 they're some people uh you know uh some special people who are capable of it right i'm mean, so asking whether human beings have free will or not that's like asking uh, can human beings climb the Himalayas? Okay, well, yes, so, yeah. but, <laughs> yes, but it's tiny majority, tiny minority, uh, actually capable of it. <laughs> or running the mile in a certain by certain minutes. Right? I understand. So if we take this Nietzsche Nietzschean framework of the Ubermensch or people that do have that, I'll, I'll ask it one more time. Do you have free will, Minsu? <laughs> <laughs> um. 
That's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think the older I get, uh, the more I look back on my life and I see that so much of uh, terrible, terrible decisions that have marked my life <laughs> that I thought were based on free will. It may not actually be it with a, with a uh, given time. Uh, maybe there is sort of the mechanical way that I was following certain programming. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's like, I, you know, as I said before, we live in, I, I just feel like we live in really dark times. So I'm having these dark thoughts, thoughts about it and so on. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I, yeah. You know, but, but what's interesting is that um, I, um, you know, uh, I was, I was talking to one of my uh, uh, well, good friends about, uh, about uh, East Asian philosophy and, uh, um, and I just, uh, so I'm, I'm also a fiction writer. Um, I, uh, so I write fiction and I, um, and I, I just mentioned that, like, so many of my early fiction, they, they were kind of, I mean, in certain ways, not wholly, um, you know, uh, kind of informed by Confucian philosophy, because I, I, I really do like reading Confucian philosophy and all that. But um, but recently, I, I I think I've taken a really uh, um, a, a, a big turnaround and reaction against Confucian philosophy. So a lot of my, the recent stories that I've been writing have some Buddhist quality to it, right? And, uh, um, and you know, my friend said, you know, that happened all the time with Joseon Dynasty intellectuals. As they got older. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, oh. they would be confused, confused, confused throughout their lives. And then they, then they start nearing retirement age and all of a sudden they take up Buddhism. You know? so, uh, so maybe I'm following an intergenerational <laughs> pattern. Maybe as we get closer to death or something like that, we, we want to go to the good place rather than somewhere else. <laughs> Maybe it is. Um, we live in dark times. This was a really good book I enjoyed. The Idea of Decline uh, by mm -hmm. Arthur Herman, which yeah. looks at the idea that we are living in dangerous periods. But it's right. an intellectual history looking at that concept over time. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming towards the end of this conversation, Minsu, but just because my students ask me about this all the time, what is Confucianism? <laughs> they put the, sorry professor what is confucianism is it just like <laughs> bowing or i know it's it's too much it's too big a question but right, just as you've right. described it there confucius confucianism impacted your work it's gone towards buddhism just a, a, a small observation what confucianism is in that sense mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, as an academic, I'm always new at things. So but then I always say, well, there's at least three different. Yeah, yeah. Right? There's always a triangle. Uh, well, there's Confucianism. Confucianism is as philosophy. Uh, you know, that comes from Confucius and Mencius and uh, um, and the Neo-Confucian philosophers like Xu Xi and so on, um, which advocates uh, morality-based government, uh, meritocracy, mm. um, uh, uh, meritocracy. Uh, um, so a linking of filial piety with loyalty to the country and uh, advocates, uh, advocacy of the five great relationships that are at, at the center of it and all that. So that's one. And so mm. it's the philosophy in itself, right? Um, and then Confucianism as it was practiced in societies like China and Korea and Vietnam. Um, that includes... Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, that, that includes, uh, you know, uh, basically a dynastic monarchism, but also in which, um, uh, in which the, uh, the bureaucracy is filled with intellectuals rather than military people as in Japan, um, mm. you know, so institution of, uh, exam system, um, and, uh, uh, and so on. So, um, and, and also kind of, uh, the, the peculiar form of, East Asian form of feudalism, which is different from East Asian, uh, European feudalism, uh, where it's much more centralized, but at the same time, you know, in, in some ways more fluid, in some ways more fluid. Um, and then uh, there's a third aspect of it, is Confucianism as a, uh, a, a Han-like <laughs> mystical <laughs> Careful. oriental ideology uh, yeah. that uh, politicians make use of for whatever reason that they do. Um, to me, one of the most hilariously ironic aspects of that third part of Orientalism is how when every society in East Asia was becoming modernized, China, Japan, you know, uh, Korea and all that, one of the biggest villains was Confucianism and Confucius, right? That's the old way. That's the decadent, you know, old way. And there's, in, in China, they're burning down Confucian temples, you know, and burning Confucian texts and all that. And well, that was all that was wrong with all, uh, you know, uh, with the old ways that modernity is uh, is um, is correcting, right? Uh, 
but then these countries uh, achieve a level of wealth and you know uh, and you know uh, self-respect and all that, and all of a sudden confusionism is back. Mm -hmm. We managed to achieve all of this big thanks to confusion ideas and you know our, our emphasis on education, on the family, on loyalty to the country, right? Uh, so <laughs> it's like. And and now Confucius is back, you know, and everybody's using this sort of phantom image of Confucius, which has nothing to do with Confucius himself or his philosophy, uh, as as yet another one of these mystical explanations of why these historical events happen, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there's a direct connection with sort of that idea of Han and idea of Confucianism, right? I said uh, it's a fantastic explanation. I certainly agree with that third part, how it's used to describe not only success, but also tragedies. Sometimes it will be used as a catch all to to explain the things that are taking part in a nation. Right. Uh, it's really good. Um, I have three remaining questions for you today. Sure. Minsu. Uh, the first one is uh, is a little bit of a cheeky question. Um, before we started this conversation, you you said that you're a Korean and you've also said that you've grown up in various places. Um, so if you grew up in Korea rather than with a father as a diplomat in various parts of the world, would you have a different view of Han in that alternate history? If you grew up in the, has that, has your personal experiences affected that in any way? Or do you think, no, that this is your position? And I ask that respectfully, respectfully, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, um, oh sure. Um, I, I know for a fact that a great deal of my skepticism that has anything to do with nationalist or ethnic or racial essentialism comes directly out of my experience of multiple cultures mm, yeah. about how everybody seems to be the same seem to be the same thing everybody seems to be saying the same thing to point to their utter uniqueness right? mm. um, and as a historian um, I've learned um, about the exact dynamics of that how why people do it how they do it um, you know what what the nationalist use of it and so on right um, yeah, it's really. I mean, it's it's really hard to know. I mean, you know, um, you know, I actually I actually think about alternate histories of myself all the time. If things have different, different, you know, what kind of person would I become, and all of that. And yeah. uh, but um, you know, um, yeah. I mean, I I uh, of course I can't know, but um, but it was uh, it was. Um, but you know, after having spent most of my life of uh, you know abroad, uh, I did serve in the Korean military. I did do my military service, um, and more, more, less said about that, the better. It was, it was, it was horrible. It was just, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but I did get to interact a lot with uh, people, my men my age, um, who know nothing about Korea. I mean, for whom this was, uh, and, um, and seeing how they were reacting toward you know, sort of the uh, military education, which basically propaganda and what they saw as their role in the army and uh, and what they hoped to get uh, get out of it and what their uh, hopes for the future was, right? Um, mm. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt this really big distance between myself and their perception of all of that was. Um, so, um, but I, I don't, um, but on Han itself, I don't necessarily think that I would, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I think for like, like a lot of Koreans, um, I think I would see it's not so much, unless I did, I actually did end up becoming a, a academic in Korea um, and looked into the issue. Um, I don't think I would have. I think I would have generally regarded as sort of uh, an idea that has had its day and it's mm. not really relevant to me. And uh, um, and I know that you know uh, you know the cu cultures of especially the seventies and eighties were uh, full of it, uh, full of Han and Han discourse. But um, I think even if I would grown up or uh, uh, lived all my life in Korea, I don't think I would have looked around my life in Korea and and thought that Han was a relevant relevant concept. Now. Mm. Um, it's it's really interesting. I think that ties into what you say sometimes about the intellectual history that you know we are we are products of our environment sometimes you know mm -hmm. our, our context really uh, influences how we how we see those things um and i do agree with you that it, it it's dying down i don't hear it in the university classrooms i, I might see it in some yeah. academic texts or a guardian piece or a wall street journal like han but my, my korean students don't talk about it right. um yeah. 
I, I've been deeply impressed by everything that I've read about you over the past few days while doing my research, Minsu. Whether it's whether it's the fiction, whether it's the translations that we didn't touch on today, but they're covered elsewhere on the internet. So uh, mm -hmm. if people are interested in you know your, your translations for Penguin Classics and stuff, highly recommend that they check them out. What what comes next for you? So you imagine these alternate histories, but there's a reality in front of you. Are you going to do a Chandawan and go to a Buddhist temple and do some <laughs> some time there? <laughs> what comes next? Yeah. Um, so um, I, uh, I, you know, since I spent so much of my last years uh, doing uh, work on Korean, uh, uh, Korean classic fiction and, and all that, uh, I do feel the need to come back to European history. And sure. uh, uh but um, but the project I'm doing is uh, it's it's quite interesting. It's a uh, um, it's it's about why the modern fantasy fiction was invented in the 1930s, in particularly with J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, C.S. Lewis in England and in um, in America with Robert E. Howard who created uh, Conan the Barbarian and H.P. Mm. Uh, Lovecraft who wrote those creepy horror stories. Um, and uh, um, and so what I'm doing, uh, I mean, because, so what I'm doing is that uh, I'm looking at intellect, I mean, I'm doing sort of intellectual history of the 1930s um, mm. about sort of this general feeling that was out there of um, just things going awry. And I mean, World War One was of course horrible, but at least during the 1920s, there was reconstruction, there was a hope for a better world and League of Nations and, uh, uh, and all of that. And in mm -hmm. the 30s, everything just seemed to be heading toward catastrophe. You know, the Spanish Civil War, the Nazi seizing power in uh, 33, and all of it, you know, really goes down to the Great Depression and its enormous impact, right? Um, mm. So, um, so uh, I find it interesting that, um, that a lot of the uh, great intellectuals of the 30s thought that this was an age where um, where political engagement was absolutely important, absolutely crucial, right? So art, that Oscar Wilde and art for art's sake is now, I mean, when the Nazis are marching, it's it's kind of hard. So so this is the generation that produced the likes of W.H. Arden and uh, George Orwell and uh, Christopher Isherwood in, uh, in, in England, right? Um, but on the other hand, you still had like people like Tolkien and uh, C.S. Lewis for whom it was withdrawn. It was just seeing the devastation of the mob and re redrawing themselves into this fantasy world. And you know, the fantasy has uh, has always existed, uh, existed. But um, I, my argument is that they they come out with a particular type of fantasy that I call. I, I'm still working on this. Uh, the the, mm -hmm. the term that I'm going with is what I call meta realist fantasy, which is actually. Um, uh, which is actually traditional fantasy with realism techniques, right? Mm -hmm. It's so it's not uh, anti-realism; it's realism and fantasy brought together. So you get like all these super details about like what the hobbits eat for breakfast, cooking, and, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. and how the moon looks, uh, you know, when Aragorn looks at it, and so on, right? I mean, this is sort of creation, uh, creation of uh, you know, um, um, you know, completely alternate universes, which. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I'm arguing it's not total escapism because they don't, um, you know, again, with the Nazis marching and the fascists taking over in Spain and, you know, people starving uh, from the Great Depression and everything, um, they don't flee to utopias because oftentimes the world that they describe in Middle Earth and, uh, and elsewhere are also worlds that are deeply troubled mm. uh, by great evil. But there's a way there's a way in which they're trying to reconstruct uh you know the kind of troubles that they're going in a different era um so that's that's one part of it so i'm, I'm so i'm doing a lot of readings on, uh, on that but um but i'm going to connect it with why uh starting from the year 1999 when the first lord of the rings and the first harry potter film um you know uh came out that fantasy as a genre just freaking exploded um mm -hmm. in the culture I mean, before fan there was a like a niche of fantasy nerds who read that, but now everybody's doing fantasy. Um, right. You know, Game of Thrones and all that, and they're they're still, you know, I mean, they're still, you know, um, ca carrying on with it and so on. Um, and uh, um, and I I think I'm going to argue that there's sort of this disturbing parallels to the 1930s and uh, and the post Cold War era 
that is also making a lot of people turn away from modernity um, to these fantasy lands mm. where, again, it's not completely, um, you know, uh, escapism, because like, for instance, if you watch Game of Thrones, the kind of world that they describe is deeply, deeply troubled, yeah. full of its own terrible sufferings and crises. Um, but at the same time, the, you know, the things that they still make sense, uh, where there is clear good and clear evil, and the triumph of the good. And but there's also kind of negative impact of that. Um, because when, you know, in the 30s, people like Tolkien and uh, um, Narnia uh, and C.S. Lewis uh, rejected modernity. They also rejected a lot of things that we feel is good about modernity, except uh, like, for instance, democracy. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, none of them liked mass, uh, you know, uh, political movements. Um, and uh, um, and so you get you get I, I mean I, I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones but there's this uh, mm. sort of quintessential moment at the very last episode where all the surviving good guys have gathered together and they're trying to figure out you know the post-war era and one of the characters suggests that instead of having kings why don't we have elections and he gets freaking laughed at everybody just laughs at him and makes jokes like hey why don't we why don't we give my horse a vote why don't we give dogs a vote right I mean. <laughs> And um, and that inherent contempt for democracy is endemic in fantasy uh, literature, uh, in contemporary fantasy, you know, in a way that deeply disturbs me. Mm. Um, there are exceptions, like uh, like a great British uh, fantasy writer, China Mirville, who's actually a, his daytime job is as, as a neo-Marxist e economist. He's he's written very much anti-monarchist, pro-revolutionary fantasy novels, right? It's like, uh, but he's, he's really an exception rather than the rule. So, um, so yeah, so I think my next book is going to be mainly about the 1930s and the historical context that, that, uh, that uh, created the modern fantasy. But I think at least one, possibly two mm -hmm. chapters of it is going to be comparing it to uh, the explosion of fantasy in the contemporary era. Um, I certainly know what you mean about that explosion because... When I grew up, like the people that were into Dungeons and Dragons and Lord of the Rings, they were nerds. Like nobody had yeah. we, we we played football or we did this stuff and then all of <laughs> right. a sudden it became mainstream. You had to know right. about orcs and elves and things like this. Uh, just one last question on that, Minsu. Do you see this the the explosion of that literature, fant meta fantasy realism in the thirties with Tolkien and and Lewis and such forth mm. and in the nineteen nineties? Is it an omen? Are they soothsayers? Do we see elements of the, you know, the future coming out, or is it just a convenient parallel? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, well, I mean, I, I think it's a reaction. Uh, I, I think it's a, okay, it's a re yeah. uh, reaction to deeply troubled, uh, because you know, um, I, you know, I, I recently got really interested in um, the the subfield of medievalism, which is, um, I, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was. You know, I loved it when I discovered that this field exists. So there's this medieval studies, which mm -hmm. looks at them, you know, which studies Middle Ages. Um, and there's a whole other set, uh, academic field called medievalism study, which is a study of what people in the past have thought about the Middle Ages. Okay. And right. what uses mm -hmm. that they made about the Middle Ages. Um, and it's a burgeoning field right now. Um, and what they showed is that... Um, this in, this great interest in all things medieval it props up every time there's a perception of Christ and modernity in uh, culture, right? So um, so it is um, so it is during the time when the French Revolution went completely awry into the Jacobin uh, horrors and uh, and the world burning in the Napoleonic Wars that you had Romanticism, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. rejected the values of the Enlightenment, which looked to Greece and Rome. As it's you know, uh, so, and and now media, uh, Middle Ages is back in, right? So uh, you know, everybody in Britain all of a sudden loves Robin Hood and King Arthur, <laughs> and and, uh, and, uh, and you get that also later in the period. So you um, so uh, also I, I I look at the birth of modern fantasy in the 1930s, another spasm of medievalism, um, mm. and which we're going through now, um, and um, and a lot of it is like really disturbing for people in medieval studies, because I've seen a number of books that try to uh, decry uh, people in extremist policies, making use of medieval tropes for their ideas. Um, and, uh, um, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, so that's, a I, I, you know, so yeah, I'm not, um, you know, I, um, I think you could write an entire book about how bad historians are at predicting the future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I also have an I, I I also have the notion of why that doesn't mean that their expertise in the past is uh it, you know uh is is problem because I I mean I um I, you know I can't go into it but you know uh, when I was thinking about this and I and I discovered uh, chaos uh, theory chaos mathematics that mm. that gave me an answer as to why even if you have a great way of analyzing what happened that doesn't mean that you can use the same tools to figure out what's going to happen in the future right. Uh, so prophecy, I don't know. I, 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 I hope not. I hope the world is not heading toward another, another mm. world war at the level of a second world war. But what you said about a, a reaction, especially ideas as a reaction, I think is fascinating. And it's really it's really great, Minsu, to hear you put it into words and to describe it through those historical contexts, because I've often believed that some of what we're experiencing these days in terms of the rise of identity and the focus on who we are on an intersectionality basis and spectrums these all come as ideas as a reaction to what was before because mm -hmm. i grew up and i was always told don't pay attention to anyone's identity i got some very good mm -hmm. schooling but i was always told that it doesn't matter what color skin or what religion they are that was drilled into me by my professors and mm -hmm. now it's the exact opposite now we're meant right. to pay attention and it, it just seems mm -hmm. to be a reaction to what was once before so I, I, I think that framework still resonates very much mm -hmm. today. It's, it's mm -hmm. great to hear you talk Absolutely. about it. Um, yeah. My last question for you, Minzu, and before I ask it, it it's been fascinating hearing you uh, talk mm -hmm. about all these things. I, I've really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. My last question, Minzu, for you is that we're all in this world together and mm -hmm. some of us believe in hand, some of us don't believe in hand. We all have different, <laughs> different explorations, but what should we be living for? How can we make maybe our lives more valuable or the lives of other people more meaningful? What's the meaning of life, Minsu? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think it's related to Han and my problem with it. Um, I think the kind of world we find ourselves right now is uh, we're in absolute absolutely important need for the recognition of the universality of suffering. And uh, to me, the sectioning off the notions of essentialism and exceptionality is, um, is very, very problematic, right? And that's why I, um, that, I mean, that, that's why, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in, your first, in my answer to your first question that you, uh, that you asked, um, in my critique of Sandra Kim, um, you know, me saying that, I, you know, I, I don't think I live in a time where we can lackadaisically, uh, you know, um, say stuff like, if people believe it, then it's true. Uh, that's not mm -hmm. really a critique of her. That's more of an explanation, I think, of, um, you know, where I'm coming from, of, you know, what I see in the world. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, though, I mean, I, I mean, one of the things I realized recently is that that really gets in the way of the kind of recognition of, you um, uh, the universality of human suffering is that, um, I mean, there, there's a there's a quality that I call um, uh, there's a quality that I call um, abstract empathy, right? Uh, which answers the question of why some of my friends had said, you know, I I encounter these people who are just perfectly fine human beings in their in their private life, right? I mean, they're they're really generous to people and they're kind, of, but they vote for like the most awful people who espouse the most awful ideology. And it's horrifying. I mean, it's just like, I, and, uh, and I don't get it. I don't, I don't get why there's a difference, um, you know, why they are here to ideology that are racist and xenophobic and sexist and all that when as individuals, they're, they're perfectly wonderful human beings, right? Um, and the thing is, I, I mean, but the thing is, I, I think there's a quality that those people lack, which is, um, which is abstract empathy, which is that, um, so when there are people right in front of me, people that I know and people I care about and people I love and they are suffering, it's it's kind of natural and easy for me to jump in and, you know, and, and try to care for them and all of that. Right. But when people are far away um, and I don't know those people and the only information that I had is, you know, um, is, you know, what the media tells them. Um, but nevertheless, people who are who are, you know, uh, who are capable of abstract empathy they're able to get over that. So you may have, you know, have somebody saying, you know, I don't know any black people, but um, I can just see that if I were them and I was, I was treated like that in the society, I would not like it. And therefore, despite the fact that I don't know any black people, I'm still going to support Black Lives Matter, right? Mm. 
Uh, I don't know any uh, undocumented aliens, but um, and, and none of them are my type. But when I see the stories about the horrible conditions that they are fleeing and they're just trying to survive, um, if I were in their shoes, like, I mean, uh, they would be horrible. So I'm, I'm going to support them and so on, right? I mean, that, that's abstract empathy. And mm. I, I just think like perfectly good, fine people are not capable of it. They're, they're only capable of having empathy for the people in front of it. And um, and what what one of the really interesting um, things that that also explains to explain to me, you know, why some people are capable of uh, abstract empathy and some people are not. Um, I ran across this uh, um, uh, this this wonderful sociological concept that you know I explained to my students and they all loved it, right? Uh, and it's called uh, outgroup homogeneity, right? Uh, outgroup homogeneity. Um, and it's the concept that um, if um, for the people of the in-group, right? So the people of whom you are a member, right? Mm. You, you know, you're a member of, you know, like say for instance, you're a member of this country or you're a member of this race or you're a member of this town or you're a member. Um, you tend to think of those members of the, of the group that you belong to as discrete individuals who are all unique and different and all that, right? Um, but there's a tendency to regard people outside of the group, people who are not of your country, not of your race, not of your community, and increasingly homogeneous terms, homogeneous mm. terms, right? Like they're all the same, mm. right? And the further they are away they are, uh, the easier it is to, you know, uh, you know, sort of have this built-in stereotypes about what they are like as a whole, right? Um, and uh, uh, and this is sort of something uh, psychologically we naturally tend to do. Right, um, and uh, and and uh, uh, and that's uh, and and outgroup homogeneity is is I think a, a, one of the prime obstacles to uh, developing abstract empathy, right? Um, because first of all, you have to see the other as unique individual human beings who have as deep a inner life as you do, and and, and feel the same pain as, as you do. Um, and, and by the way, it's, it's 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 great because like I uh, one one of my graduate students who's a high school teacher, when I explained this term, immediately the next day he explained it to his high school uh, high school students, and one of them said, "Oh my God, we do that, right? I mean, we already think like if I look at me and my friends, where I see them as unique individuals, mm. but I see those people and they are nerds, they are jocks, you know, they are cheerleader girls and all that, like they're all the same, right? Uh, um, and uh, um, and so um. And so, you know, with a world that has become as small as it is, I think it's uh, we're on a race to, you know, overcome our group homogeneity and develop abstract empathy. Um, as uh, as W. H. Auden said in the poem that he wrote, um, you know, I, I mean, this is a sentence in a poem that he wrote that sounds co like a complete like cliche, except except when you see it in the context of the poem that he wrote on the day that the Nazi tanks started to uh, roll into Poland. And the quote is, we must all love one another or die. Mm. And I shall end it there because that's so poetic. <laughs> Okay, I'll cut it there. Uh, I'll leave it on that. But it's really, it, it's John Donne for whom the bell tolls as well, isn't it? It's very, you know, we're just, right, absolutely. It, yeah. we're, we're all connected. We're all tied into each other. And I, I really like that sort of, um, that the way that you explained that we all, we see the people around us as unique individuals and characterized mm -hmm. by difference, but Ed, the people, the further away, they're just so much more modern. They're just one. And right. by that, we then project all those characteristics onto a whole population. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the way you've described that is, yeah, we need to be more focused on that and a bit more focused on Auden. That's brilliant. Yeah. Th thank okay. you, Minsu. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this a lot. <laughs>